Hi, I'm Jerry the King Lawler, WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler, and you, my friend, are watching another original wrestling documentary. James Harris, also known as Sugar Bear Harris, Big Jim Harris, Kamala the Ugandan Giant, and later the Ugandan Headhunter, was a professional wrestler who debuted in 1978 when he was hired by Bill Watts under his NWA Tri-State Territory. Throughout his career, he would appear in over a dozen promotions, including WWF and WCW. Born in 1950 in Mississippi, James experienced racism at an early age and would throughout most of his life at different levels. By the early 2000s, he was only making sporadic appearances and his last match was on August 15, 2010 at a Juggalo Championship Wrestling event. The following year, his health took a downward spiral as he had his left leg amputated below the knee due to complications of high blood pressure and diabetes. He would fight the condition over the next decade. After losing his right leg and ultimately succumbing to COVID-19 in August 2020 at the age of 70. This is the story of James Harris, a.k.a. Kamala the Ugandan Headhunter. James was born on May 28, 1950 in Sanatobia, Mississippi. He was one of six children. While by this time most children were born in a hospital, James was born in a cabin on a plantation in Sanatobia where his mother and father worked as sharecroppers. His father, Jesse Harris, was killed during a dice game during a gambling dispute when James was only four years old. Because racism was very prevalent at that time, his murder went virtually uninvestigated and subsequently unsolved, which would impact James for his entire life. Growing up in a rough area of town, which was very much segregated and raised by a single parent, his mother would remarry and move the family to nearby Coldwater, 30 miles south of Memphis. James grew up in a world that still had separate bathrooms for blacks and whites and had no signs of equality anywhere. African Americans were treated with disrespect everywhere they went and would have to answer to whites with yes sir and no sir, even if they were younger. James knew this wasn't how the world really was, as one day white insurance salesmen came from New York and when his mother called the 18 year old sir, he would reply, ma'am you don't need to call us that. James knew that the world outside his small bubble was much different. As James got older, he became a sharecropper himself, picking cotton and growing corn. Any money he made was used to help the family, who barely made enough to carve out a living. No matter how much he made, his cost always outweighed the profits. But James would do his best to remain positive. He attended Coldwater Elementary, but his home life was no picnic. With constant fighting and arguing, because bad harvests threatened the family finances, his mother and stepfather's relationship turned into a physical one. His mother was a tough woman, and during physical altercations, she would regularly get the best of his stepdad, including even beating him with a window stick. Once the physical melee was done, she sat down calmly and took a sip out of her wine. In grade 8, James would join the football team. His coach would describe him as a big sweet guy with a good attitude and nicknamed him Sugar Bear, already tipping the scales at over 275 pounds. Even though he was a lot larger than other students, he still got bullied and lost most of the fights he was in simply because he just didn't fight back because he was worried people might start hating him. Until one day he stood up to one of the bullies in math class and knocked his desk over with him in it. From that point on, James would stand up for himself and began to earn the respect of his peers. James made it to the ninth grade and dropped out. As a farmer, he saw no use in continuing and felt he was wasting his days in a classroom. He had big dreams of owning his own farm, but while his ambitions were high, James fell into a life of petty crime in order to fill his empty stomach. Between harvests, sometimes there was not enough food to go around and he began stealing, which, being African American in the mid-60s in Mississippi, could lead to a death sentence if caught. Normally, the police would shoot first and ask questions last. He broke into the high school cafeteria and stole a few dozen cookies and some change that was left in the register. After committing more serious thefts such as shoplifting and stealing from other farmers, James broke into a house, 
but because Coldwater was such a small town, it didn't take long until rumors turned into accusations and James got a stern warning by an overzealous cop that he better leave town. Because of the racial tension between white police officers and African Americans, James decided to take the threat seriously and at the advice of his former football coach, he went to work on a farm in Florida. At the age of 17, with his ninth grade education, he packed a single bag and headed to Florida, ended his life of crime and never looked back. He began working on a farm in Florida, picking fruit where he was paid a dollar an hour plus room and board. When he wasn't working or fishing, his escape would be the Monday night wrestling matches at the West Palm Beach Auditorium. Watching wrestlers like Eddie Graham and the Great Malenko, he was hooked instantly. He became an addict and would attend the Monday night wrestling matches religiously. Watching stars in the early 70s from Dusty Rose to Thunderbolt Patterson to Terry Funk, James couldn't get enough. At 18 years old, after saving his money from working on the farm, picking up overtime hours when he could, and even began shooting dice, he bought his first car, a 1958 Black Oldsmobile. Eventually, James learned how to fix small engines and learned about construction, opening up more opportunities for him, and he left the farm. Now 19 years old and over 300 pounds, he moved into a rooming house. He would eventually get a job as a roofer and even open up his own company. But James was homesick and moved back to Mississippi for a short time. But when he realized the job opportunities were limited, he moved to Michigan and began driving truck for a living. One of his co-workers happened to know where Bobo Brazil lived and after convincing James his size might be his ticket into the business, they dropped by Bobo Brazil's house. Bobo wasn't home at the time, but his wife told him to go see Tiny Tim Hampton. Because of James' easygoing and humble personality, they hit it off immediately and he began his training. Eventually, Bobo Brazil returned from touring and they both trained James. Because James was an experienced truck driver, he became the designated driver for both Bobo and Tiny Tim. At the time, they were both performing on and off for Vince McMahon Sr. and the WWWF. Although James loved wrestling, he didn't see himself as a wrestler and just looked at it as a job he could make some quick money and move back home. After countless training sessions, he still hadn't been informed the match results were predetermined. The entire time in his early training, James assumed everything was all real. Eventually, James started setting up the ring in the local promotion in exchange for front row tickets where he would watch Bobo Brazil battle the Sheik in the main event. After he saw the Sheik thanking Bobo for a great match afterwards, Bobo let him in on the secret of pro wrestling. Not liking Michigan winters, James decided to rekindle his relationship with an ex-girlfriend and headed to Arkansas. He continued his training with veteran Mario Gelanto, who began training James in the psychology of the business as well as timing and how to make his easygoing, friendly personality into a vicious monster in the ring. Early in his career, James decided being a villain in the ring was the right fit for him. In 1978, he was ready for his first match which was against a great Mephisto to a small TV crowd in Greenwood, Mississippi. He joined International Championship Wrestling, which ran the state of Mississippi, owned by George Curtis Culkin and his son Gil. Their television show aired Friday nights throughout the entire state. Not quite considered an outlaw territory, the ICW were members of the AWA, where Nick Bockwinkle defended his title several times. His first match ended up in a double DQ. Sugar Bear Harris was born. The great Mephisto took James under his wing. Some of his first opponents included Tom Boogaloo Shaft, Pork Chop Cash, and Donnie Fargo. Now 28 years old, James was on his way, had one goal in mind, perfecting his craft. He would later become managed by Percy Pringle and drafted into his stable of heels, where he would change his name to Ugly Bear Harris. But that name wouldn't last long. He would use others such as Big Jim Harris, the Mississippi Mauler, and Bad Leroy Brown. James would bounce around a few smaller promotions and land in Leroy McGurk's Tri-State Wrestling, where he was managed by Izzy Slapowitz. He also met future WWE Hall of Famer Jim Ross, who advised James to try and travel around as much as he could. It wasn't easy for African-American professional wrestlers in this era as most promotions would limit their card to only one or two, and the South being a black wrestler was a gimmick in itself. James won his first championship in NWA Tri-State in 1979, teaming with Oki Shakina to win the NWA Tri-State Tag Team Championship. In 
In early 1980, he packed his bags and headed to Mexico, where most of the wrestlers were much smaller, making him a special attraction on the card. He regularly worked three shows per day, which was possible south of the border. After six months of bad payoffs in Mexico, James headed back to the U.S. and landed in Southeastern Championship Wrestling as Bad News Harris, winning the NWA Southeastern Heavyweight Championship. In 1981, James traveled to Europe for seasoning. Following a stint in Germany, he traveled to the United Kingdom, where he wrestled for joint promotions as the Mississippi Mauler, a character with some similarities to his future Kamala character. In June 1981, he competed in a tournament for the vacant WWA World Heavyweight Championship, losing to Wayne Bridges in the final in Wembley Arena in London. After Japanese promoters got a look at James, they planned to bring him over to face Giant Baba, but Abdullah the Butcher was already established in Japan and threw cold water on it. James had established the Mississippi Mauler gimmick based on the Missouri Mauler Larry Hamilton, which James watched as a fan. His Mississippi Mauler was similar to the Kamala gimmick, which would bring him worldwide fame later on in his career. Ironically, Larry Hamilton was an outspoken racist and a card-carrying member of the KKK. In late 1981, James even made a short tour of Africa along with his fellow UK performers. He landed back in the United Kingdom, but that tour would be cut short after he broke his ankle. In early 1982, still nursing his broken ankle, James headed back to the US and began looking for a truck driving job. But jobs driving truck were few and far between. He decided to go visit his friend, the dream machine Troy Graham, at a CWA wrestling show in Memphis, and upon entering the locker room, ran into Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett. Fresh off the Andy Kaufman angle, ratings were hot and they were looking for a big man to keep the momentum going. Jerry Lawler took one look at James and saw dollar signs. Even though he still had a cast on his ankle for another month, negotiations began. Jerry Lawler instructed James to leave the arena as he didn't want any of the fans to see him, just yet. Jerry Lawler, being a comic book fanatic, offered James a role of a face-painted Ugandan cannibal. James didn't even have to think it over and told Lawler right away he would take on the role. The character was a vicious headhunter with a face and body paint copied from a Frank Frazetta painting. His backstory was that he was a former bodyguard of the President of Uganda who had been discovered by J.J. Dillon during an excursion to Africa. A promotional vignette aired on WMC-TV featuring a spear-welding Kamala seemingly emerging from a steamy African jungle. The vignette was actually filmed at Jarrett's farm in Henderson, Tennessee, with the steam effect created using dry ice, complete with one of Jerry Jarrett's wife's hoop earrings through his nose and an African mask he had hanging on his wall. The name Kamala was taken straight out of a National Geographic magazine named after Dr. Kamala, a researcher in Uganda. To establish Kamala as a monstrous character, Jarrett and Lawler instructed him to wrestle in a brawling style, with chops and biting and to never perform any traditional wrestling moves. Instead of 24 days to heal his ankle, James had 24 hours, cutting his cast off with a drywall knife. To preserve kayfabe, James refused to speak English while in public in Memphis. Kamala made his debut in the CWA in May 1982 with Dylan as his manager. Within two weeks, he was in the main event, losing to Lawler by disqualification in a match that sold out the Mid-South Coliseum. In June, he defeated Lawler for the Southern Heavyweight Championship, which he held until August of that year. With J.J. Dillon busy with other commitments, James was paired with Buddy Wayne, who portrayed the original Friday character. Jerry Lawler would tap into the racist fans they performed in front of, in James's book, Kamala Speaks, he would state, Lawler wasn't racist at all. However, a racist joke dropped in the right place would show how smart Lawler is. Any cheap heat racist shots at my expense were always first earlier mentioned to me in the locker room, and I almost always gave them my blessing. According to James, racist humor didn't bother him, but racist promoters wanting to pay him less because he was African American was a whole other story. Jimmy Hart would add Kamala to his first family while he feuded with Dutch Mantel. Toward the end of the year, he feuded with imposter Kamala too. When James left Memphis, he also left behind his face painter Jerry Lawler. He would change the design from a big star on the top of his head to a design that was easier for him to apply himself. In late 1982, Kamala began wrestling for Bill Watts' Mid-South Wrestling Promotion. He was managed by Skandar Akbar and Friday, now portrayed by Frank Dalton, forming part of Akbar's villainous Devastation Inc. stable. In April 1983, he wrestled Andre the Giant to a highly promoted boat at the Louisiana Superdome. 
During 1983, he also faced a junkyard dog in a series of Battle of the Monsters matches. The biggest money James ever made during his career was during this time with Mid-South Wrestling and his feud with the junkyard dog. Before leaving, he would have legendary feuds with Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Dr. Death Steve Williams. In March of 1983, Kamala along with Friday and Skandar Akbar made their way to Dallas and debuted in Fritz Von Erich's World Class Championship Wrestling promotion. His first match in the Sportatorium was a sellout. In October of that year, he challenged Charlie Race for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, losing by disqualification. In the same month, he began a lengthy feud with the Von Erich family, repeatedly facing brothers David, Kerry, and Kevin. In May 1984, he faced a great kabuki at the David Von Erich Memorial Parade of Champions, a tribute to David Von Erich who had died suddenly in February. In late 1983, James put a down payment on his first house and started dating a neighbor who lived nearby. They would stay together until 2003. During this time, he would regularly team up with the missing link and became very close friends. In March of 1984, Kamala faced Bruiser Brody in a steel cage match. Both men were paid $3,000, which sold out weeks before the event. On May 6, 1984, WCCW held its annual tribute to David Von Erich in the Texas Stadium. 43,500 fans packed to see Kamala battle the Great Kabuki. This would be Kamala's final match in WCCW as he wasn't happy with his $4,000 he was paid for the event and all his other matches for the previous week. He left without giving any notice. Kamala debuted in the World Wrestling Federation in July of that year. He was managed by Freddie Blassie and Friday, first played by Frank Dalton, then Steve Lombardi. In a segment on the television program Tuesday Night Titans, Kamala seemingly devoured a live chicken with a cutaway shot of feathers flying out of his mouth shown to create the illusion. After defeating a series of opponents including B. Brian Blair, Salvatore Belomo, and Chief J. Strongbow, in August 1984, Kamala challenged Hulk Hogan for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship, wrestling him to a double countout. In October of 1984, he began a series of matches against Andre the Giant, among them a steel cage match which he lost after Andre twice sat on his chest. Due to Andre's rough treatment of him, he began carrying a gun and a pocket sewn into his trunks. After a few matches with the gun in his tights and hurting him when he took bumps, he began carrying a knife instead, which is a ritual he would continue for the next 15 years. James made it clear to Andre he wasn't going to put up with that type of treatment, and Andre apologized and worked light with him from then on. They had matches all over the world without any problems. Kamala's final appearance during that run in the WWF was in a battle royal in November of 1984. After leaving the WWF later that year, Kamala went on to appear with multiple promotions throughout the United States and Canada. Throughout 1985, he wrestled for the Minneapolis, Minnesota-based American Wrestling Association. He was established as a monster by winning a series of handicap matches. He feuded with Sergeant Slaughter, whom he had defeated in a Ugandan death match in April of 1985, but lost in a boot camp steel cage match in June. At the Super Clash Supercard in September 1985, Kamala lost to Jerry Blackwell in a body slam challenge. Toward the end of the year, Kamala repeatedly challenged Rick Martel for the AWA World Heavyweight Championship, but failed to win the title. In that same year, Kamala wrestled for Jim Crockett Promotions at the Great American Bash, unsuccessfully challenging Magnum TA for the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship. In November of that same year, Kamala made his first tour of Japan with All Japan Pro Wrestling. Wrestling as Giant Kamala, he formed a tag team with King Cobra. He made a second tour in February 1986 as Kamala, and in early 1986 he also had a short run in the Montreal, Quebec, Canada-based international wrestling promotion, where he was managed by Eddie Creechman. Now on good terms with Andre, the Giant put in a good word to Vince and Kamala returned to the WWF in July 1986, now managed by the wizard Curtis Iakea and the mask handler Kim Chi instead of Friday, portrayed by Steve Lombardi. From November 1986 to February 1987, Kamala faced Hulk Hogan in a series of matches for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship, marking the pinnacle of his career. In February 1987, he began a feud with Jake Roberts, during which Roberts repeatedly exploited Kamala's fear of snakes. In April 1987, the wizard sold Kamala's managerial contract to Mr. Fuji, and he began teaming with Sika the Wild Samoan, who was being paid a lot more than Kamala. Although he was on national TV each week, he was still falling behind on his bills. When he first started feuding with Hogan, he would be paid sometimes ten dollars to $12,000 per match and was able to stay in a decent room, eat a decent dinner and still send 99% of his money home. 
but as he dropped down the card, payoffs were as low as a few hundred dollars a match. By the time he paid his travel expenses, he was sharing rooms or even sleeping in his rental car to save money. The last straw was when he was told he would be performing at WrestleMania 3, but when he showed up, he was told there was no spot for him. James abruptly left the WWF once more in September 1987 over frustrations about his pay. After this run with the Federation, James opened up an arcade and also sponsored a local baseball team called Kamala Zulus. Kamala then returned to World Class Championship Wrestling, where he would make more money than being showcased on a national stage. He feuded with Kevin and Kerry Von Erich as well as Michael Hayes before the promotion shut down in 1989, and he returned to All Japan Pro Wrestling with Abdullah the Butcher. From 1990 to 1991, he worked for CMLL in Mexico. He lost to Mil Mascaras in a cage match on March 17, 1991. When he left the promotion and tried to cash a check, it was no good. After the death of Bruiser Brody, he swore to never go back. He then returned to Japan, working for All Japan, Wrestling International Noon Generations, and Super World of Sports into 1992. He also appeared in the Memphis-based United States Wrestling Association in 1990, feuding with Jerry Lawler and winning the USWA Unified World Heavyweight Championship four times, eventually losing it for the final time to Coco Beware. He left the company in 1992. He would remain friends with Coco Beware throughout the rest of his life. Kamala again returned to the WWF on May 9, 1992, with Kim Chi and Harvey Whippleman acting as his managers, and this time the office withholding 15% of his pay in an escrow account until the end of his contract to prevent him from leaving abruptly. In June 1992, he unsuccessfully challenged Randy Savage for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship. Throughout mid-1992, he wrestled primarily in house shows with his regular opponents including The Undertaker, Bret Hart, The Texas Tornado, and The Ultimate Warrior. Since The Warrior had a limo as part of his contract and knew James wasn't making much money, he insisted he ride with him instead of renting a car, and often paid for his hotel room as well. Kamala lost to The Undertaker by disqualification at SummerSlam in August 1992. He later claimed he was paid $13,000 for the bout, while The Undertaker was paid $500,000. Even though this was his biggest payday for a match, he couldn't help to think how it paled in comparison for what The Undertaker was making. Dave Meltzer questioned this claim, saying, I'm not saying he's lying, but it's hard to believe. In November 1992, Kamala lost to The Undertaker at Survivor Series in the first ever televised casket match. In January 1993, Kim Chi and Harvey Whippleman began mistreating Kamala, leading him to break away from them and align himself with Reverend Slick. Beginning in 1993, James wrote, performed, and produced his own music. He wrote over 100 songs. Some discuss his frustration with the working conditions he experienced in the wrestling industry, most notably the low pay. He released his debut album, The Best of Kamala Volume 1, through his official website. The album features a ballad dedicated to the memory of Stanley Tookie Williams. Slick sent out to humanize Kamala, leading to a series of skits in which he introduced him to activities such as 10-pin bowling. Kamala feuded with Kim Chi throughout early 1993. In March of that year, he began a series of matches with Bam Bam Bigelow. The two were scheduled to face one another at WrestleMania 9, but the match was cancelled. In May of that year, Kamala lost a King of the Ring tournament qualifying match via countout to Mr. Hughes on an episode of WWF Wrestling Challenge. He went on to compete primarily at house shows until being released by the WWF that July. After his WWF release became official later that month, he received his 15% of his pay that was being withheld plus interest. Following his WWF run, James stepped back from professional wrestling. He began working as a truck driver using two semi-truck trailers he had purchased following his payout from the WWF. In December 1993, he was announced as a participant in the 1994 Royal Rumble match. However, during the bout, the announcers noted that Virgil, as an alternate participant, had replaced him. At that point, he was only wrestling in independent shows and part-time for the USWA. In December of 1993, he wrestled in India where he won the vacated IAW tag team titles with Dusty Wolf, defeating Leo Burke and the Mongolian Mauler. At Hulk Hogan's suggestion, Kamala joined World Championship Wrestling in 1995. He was introduced as part of Kevin Sullivan's Dungeon of Doom stable, whose goal was to end Hulk Hogan's career. His first WCW pay-per-view appearance, he defeated Hacksaw Jim Duggan at Bash at the Beach. 
He then lost a singles match to Hogan at the Clash of Champions. He was part of the Dungeon of Doom team at Fall Brawl, which lost to Hogan's team, the Hulkamaniacs. He was only being paid $500 per appearance, and unlike many former WWF stars, did not receive a lucrative contract. After Hulk Hogan spoke with Eric Bischoff, he was bumped up to $800, but Bischoff told him to never have Hulk call him again. After a few more dates, James let Hulk know he was leaving. Hulk offered to call Bischoff again, but James declined. He went back to driving truck where he was making $500 to $1,000 per day doing local deliveries. That same year, Frank Dalton, who played Friday in Kamala's earlier career, passed away. On January 24, 1996, Kamala returned to the USWA for the final time where he teamed with Brian Christopher and PG-13 to defeat Tracy Smothers, Doug Gilbert, Jesse James Armstrong and Robert Gibson in an Ironman match. In 1998, he made several appearances in ECW, but was never under contract. Kamala participated in the Gimmick Battle Royal at WrestleMania 17 and was eliminated by Sergeant Slaughter. On July 26, 2004, he made a surprise return to World Wrestling Entertainment, participating in a Raw Diva Search segment, in which the female contestants were instructed to try and seduce him. He lost to Jim Duggan at Wrestle Reunion 1 on January 29, 2005. He then faced Randy Orton on the August 11, 2005 edition of SmackDown, accompanied by Kimchi. But the match was interrupted by a message from The Undertaker to Orton and ended in a no contest. Kamala appeared at the 2005 Taboo Tuesday event as one of the choices for Eugene's tag team partner. He lost the fan vote to Jimmy Snuka, but came to the ring after the match to deliver a big splash to Tyson Tomko. He was paid just $400. Although they reached out to him on multiple occasions to make more appearances, he declined as it was no longer worth his time and the novelty of being in the WWF was gone. Although he initially signed a Legends deal, when the contract expired he never re-signed. On September 30th, 2006, he wrestled to a no finish with Brian Danielson in a match for the Ring of Honor World Championship at a National Wrestling Alliance event in Bridgeport, Connecticut in front of 40 fans. He then defeated Lanny Poffo at a Great North Wrestling Super Show at the Ottawa Super Show in Ottawa, Canada. Kamala then appeared at Total Nonstop Action Wrestling Slammiversary pay-per-view in June 2008 as a guest at Jay Lethal and SoCal Val's Storyline Wedding. His last match was on August 15, 2010 at Juggalo Championship Wrestling with the Weed Man defeating the Haters. On November 7, 2011, James had his left leg amputated below the knee due to complications of high blood pressure and diabetes, a condition he had since 1992 which forced him to retire because he did not accept dialysis treatment. In April 2012, his right leg was also amputated below the knee and a campaign was launched seeking donations to cover his financial needs. Coco Beware bought him a high-powered scooter wheelchair so he could get around. James told the Bleach Report in 2014 that he relied on a disability check, sold handmade wooden chairs, and had written a book about his life, Kamala Speaks. In July 2016, James was named as part of a class action lawsuit filed against WWE which alleged that wrestlers incurred traumatic brain injuries during their tenure and the company concealed the risks of injury. The lawsuit was dismissed by District of Connecticut Judge Vanessa Lynn Bryant in December of 2018. Mike Johnson of Pro Wrestling Insider wrote that his involvement in the lawsuit likely prevented WWE from inducting him into their Hall of Fame. On November 19, 2017, James underwent life-saving emergency surgery to clear fluid from around his heart and lungs at a hospital in Oxford, Mississippi. He was then on life support due to complications. The next day, his stepdaughter said that he showed signs of improvement but remained on life support. On November 22, it was reported he was able to breathe on his own yet was unable to talk and remained under intensive care. On August 5, 2020, James tested positive for COVID-19 and was hospitalized. His wife said he likely contracted it from one of his numerous visits to the dialysis center. Due to COVID-19, he started to experience complications from his diabetes. He went into cardiac arrest on August 9, 2020, before dying later that afternoon at the age of 70. His mother was a huge wrestling fan and believed wrestling was real her entire life. She passed away in 1998 and James never had the heart to tell her differently. His final resting place is in the Simon Chapel Cemetery, Sardis, Panola County, Mississippi. You drift away all of the pain But it seems there's more to do There's more to love we've yet to find 
Shirley Race was a pro wrestler, promoter, and trainer. Born in Maryville, Missouri in 1943, after a rough childhood and a stint in jail, he began his career in 1959 doing odd jobs for Missouri promoter Gus Karras, driving around the 800-pound Happy Humphrey, as well as attending to his daily needs and on occasion facing him in the ring. Harley made his debut under the moniker Jack Long, the kayfabe brother of John Long. After a near-fatal car crash, which took the life of his pregnant wife and almost losing his leg, after grueling physical therapy for several months. Harley returned to the ring the following year. He would go on to become NWA World Heavyweight Champion nine times and also capturing dozens of other titles in various promotions, including being crowned the very first King of the Ring. As well as the National Wrestling Alliance, he would go on to make appearance in the AWA, WWF, WCW, and even own part of the Central States Territory. Referred to as the greatest wrestler in God's green earth, in the early 1990s, he took a step back from the business after another serious car crash. In 1999, he participated in the NBC special, Exposed Pro Wrestling Secrets. His face was covered to conceal his identity as he broke kayfabe and discussed the inner workings of the business. That same year, he started World League Wrestling, which he would continue to run until his death in 2019. One of the toughest men to ever step into the ring and would protect the life of the business, even if it meant risking his own. This is the story of Harley Race. Harley Leland Race was born to sharecroppers J. Allen Race and Mary Race on April 11, 1943 in Maryville, Missouri, weighing 8 pounds and 6 ounces, but grew up in the nearby town of Quitman. His father also worked as a bus driver to feed his brother and four sisters. At two years old, he suffered a serious eye injury, which he fell on a wire and cut open one of his eyeballs. He was an early fan of professional wrestling, watching programming from the nearby Chicago territory on the Dumont Television Network. He was in awe after watching his first match and told his family that's what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. By the 10th grade, he was the biggest kid in class as well as class president. He would enjoy practicing headlocks and other wrestling moves with lifelong friend Danny Kiever as well as fishing trips and tipping over outhouses. While in high school, an altercation with a classmate led the principal kneeing Harley in the back of the head as he tried to break up the fight. Enraged, Harley attacked him, resulting in his expulsion. Harley would go on to work on several farms including one owned by Stanislaus Sabisco, who even though he was an old man at the time, would still show Harley a few holds. At the age of 16 in 1959, Harley was arrested along with another youth to face check charges, reportedly trying to cash a $15 and an $18 check. In September of 1960, Harley was again arrested and charges of criminal assault were filed. Harley was charged with the rape of a 17-year-old College Springs girl. He was held in Page County Jail with his bail set at $5,000. He would be found not guilty and acquitted in April of 1961 after the jury deliberated for an hour and 10 minutes. In July of that same year, Harley was involved in one of many car accidents when he reportedly fell asleep behind the wheel and crashed into a tree. He was taken to the hospital and released with minor injuries. In fall of that year, Harley began working for Gus Karras in the Kansas Territory running errands as well as driving around the super heavyweight Happy Humphrey who also taught him ring psychology. Because of Humphrey's size, he could not fit in the showers and motel rooms, so he would lay on the ground and Harley would have the task of hosing him off and scrubbing him with a mop. Harley would be paid $5 a day to drive him around plus room and board, and also wrestled him on several occasions in which he would be paid $25 per match. Eventually, Harley started wrestling on some of his shows, and some of the veteran wrestlers helped further Harley's training. Harley would also wrestle in carnivals, being challenged by locals, where he would earn a tough guy reputation. His first official match was in Waterloo, Iowa, against Bill Cole. Because there were several gangs in the area, 
Harley wanted to set himself apart and to send this message loud and clear, he strung seven needles together, dipped them in Indian ink, and tattooed Lone Star on his forearm with a star underneath it. One day one of the local gangs did try and hassle him, but that was the same day he happened to have his father's shotgun in the back seat and wasn't afraid to use it. He pulled it out and sprayed their car and they never bothered him again. But every single time that I come around, I seen you got another man trying to keep you down. He married his sweetheart, Vivian Jones, in November. Unfortunately, they were involved in a severe car accident on Christmas Day, one month after the wedding. While driving in 17 inches of snow at approximately 12.35 a.m., their vehicle collided head-on with a tractor trailer full of eggs who was trying to avoid a snowdrift, sending their car flying 80 feet. Jones, who was pregnant at the time, died at the crash. Initially, Harley was also pronounced dead at the scene, but in the ambulance, the paramedics realized he still had a pulse. Harley nearly had his leg amputated as a result and was told he'd likely never walk again. Karras heard about his employee's condition, went rushing into the hospital and blocked the planned amputation, declaring it over my dead body. In doing so, he saved Harley's leg. Although he recovered, doctors told him that he might never walk again and his wrestling career was definitely over. Undaunted, Harley endured grueling physical therapy for several months and made a full recovery. For a short time, Harley studied the Bible and had hopes of becoming a minister, but the wrestling bug wouldn't leave him alone. At age 18, he moved to Nashville and began wrestling under the ring name Jack Long, forming a tag team with storyline brother John Long. The duo quickly captured the Southern Tag Team Championship. In 1963, Harley forged his driver's license and changed the year from 1943 to 1942 so he could drink legally a year earlier. In later life, it would take him almost a year to clear it up and he almost faced criminal charges. It was that same year he met Billy Strong, who also wrestled as John Long. Since him and Harley looked a lot alike and he was looking for a tag team partner, Harley would become his kayfabe brother Jack Long and would win his first belt, co-holder of the Southern Tag Team Championship. After a few months, he would win his first singles title, the Southwestern Heavyweight Championship. Around this time, Harley began challenging fans and inviting them into the ring. When they were stupid enough to do it, he figured it gave him legal right to teach them a lesson. He would instruct the security staff to let them into the ring and put them in a submission that would leave them squealing in front of the audience. If they were tough looking guys bigger than him, he would hit them with a surprise headbutt, sometimes breaking their nose. Not a lot of fans would jump into the ring with Harley, but none would ever beat him. Through his time wrestling in the old Memphis Auditorium, he would often return backstage and find one of his biggest fans waiting for him, none other than Elvis Presley. According to many sources, Elvis loved wrestling and often used wrestlers as his bodyguards. Around this time, Harley married his second wife, Sandra Jones, who regularly traveled with him. One night during a match in Glasgow, Kentucky, Harley decided to show off a move he had recently learned, a backflip from the top rope which he would land on his feet. He landed right where another wrestler had spit in the ring, his right leg slipped on the spit and twisted sideways and snapped his ankle. He finished the match then drove 100 miles back to Nashville before seeking medical attention. After his leg healed, he wrestled in Missouri for a while before heading to Amarillo, Texas, where he would work under Dory Funk Sr. for five months. This would also be the start of his serious back problems, which would haunt him till the day he died. When he returned to Kansas, the wrestling business was starting to cool down, as there were more wrestlers than events to employ them. To supplement his income, he bought a hay truck and would haul hay from farmers' fields to their barn, charging 10 cents per bale. On a good day, he would often bail a thousand, and after paying two kids he had helping him, he would walk away with seventy dollars. On nights when he was booked to wrestle, his older brother would drive the truck. 
In the mid-60s, like most men his age, Hurley received a draft notice to go fight in Vietnam. During his physical, the doctors took one look at his leg and sent him home. After parting ways with John Long and briefly using the name The Great Mortimer, under the suggestion of his father, he would begin wrestling under his given name, Harley Race. After wrestling Vern Gagne one night in Omaha, Nebraska, Vern told him he had the perfect tag team partner for him, a former All-American football player named Larry Hennig. Harley had briefly met Hennig while in Amarillo and jumped at the chance of becoming his partner. They would be billed as Handsome Harley Race and Pretty Boy Larry Hennig and would develop a close friendship that would last a lifetime. By 1965, they wasted no time gunning for the top tag team, Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher. On January 30th, they beat the veterans for the titles. Harley at 22 and Larry at 29 became the youngest AWA tag team champions at the time. The veterans wouldn't let it go and began showing up for matches dressed in blonde wigs and calling themselves the Dolly Sisters, attempting to mock the young team. Behind the scenes, Harley and Larry were honoured. In 1967, they would even go as far as to show their disdain for the young team in an issue of the Wrestling Review magazine, calling them Gertrude Henning and Sylvia Race. The angle between the two teams was still hot and continued to bring fans in. Two weeks after winning the titles, Harley was involved in an altercation at the Chestnut Tree Restaurant in Minneapolis, Minnesota. After Harley confronted a man who was harassing a woman in the restaurant, knocking him unconscious, the man's friend, John Morton, stabbed Harley in the back. Harley was hospitalized and Morton was arrested. In another attempt to gain publicity, Harley and Larry signed up for the inaugural International 500 Snowmobile Race from Winnipeg, Canada to St. Paul, Minnesota. Harley would drop out of the race early after his snowmobile broke down after 25 miles, but Larry went on to finish the race and even won the Survivor Trophy for overcoming various hardships along the way. Harley and Larry Henning were designated to feud with the Bruiser and Crusher and other top tag teams for the next several years and were given three title reigns. Vern Gagne, in particular, was promoted as a hated rival of the team, partnering with several other wrestlers in matches against Race and Henning during their AWA run. In October 1967, Gagne was credited with breaking one of Henning's legs, thus giving him some much needed time off from the ring. Harley, as the storyline went, was allowed to choose a new partner and retain the AWA World Tag Team Championship. Harley's choice was Chris Markoff, but the duo was defeated in their first title defense match against a team of Pat O'Connor and Wilbur Snyder in November of 1967. For the next several months, Harley teamed with hard-boiled Haggerty, who over the years presented Gagne with some of his greatest matches. Together, Race and Haggerty often were cast against Gagne and Cowboy Bill Watts. In March 1968, after Hennig's return to the ring, he and Harley were back together, though the two never won the AWA Tag Team Championship. Despite his tag team success, Harley left the AWA after several years at the top of the division to pursue a singles career in the National Wrestling Alliance. Being a gun enthusiast, by the late 1960s he owned literally hundreds of guns and would take at least one with him everywhere he went. By this time, Harley and his wife Sandra had split up after they had a daughter Candace Marie and he met another woman. One night while on a short road trip together, a Corvette screamed by his car. As Harley drove around the curve, the Corvette was upside down in a ditch. The engine was on fire and was spreading to the back of the car near the gas tank. Still haunted by his car crash in 1960, Harley slammed on the brakes, got out of his car and told his girlfriend to go for help. He ran to the car and positioned his shoulder under the car door and somehow managed to use his leg strength to push the car up and over onto its wheels. The driver's head rolled out of the car and over towards Harley's feet. The last thing Harley wanted to see happen was to see his body burn up with the car, so he grabbed him and pulled him away, but it was too late. The man had lost his life. The local media covered the event and Harley was looked at as a hero for risking his own life trying to save the man. The only problem with that is Harley worked for years trying to become a villain, but the event would cause fans to begin cheering him. Even flipping them off didn't work, they still cheered. 
Harley married his third wife, Yvonne. Together they had a son, Justin. In 1970, after a match, an irate fan grabbed the starting bell and attacked Harley, who would retaliate by striking the fan. Harley was taken to the hospital after being treated, but no charges were laid. In 1973, he took the nickname Mad Dog after a fan threw a piece of raw meat in the ring and Harley bit into it like a rabid animal. That same year, he faced NWA World Heavyweight Champion Dory Funk Jr. in Kansas City. Harley emerged from the battle as the new champion in what was perceived by fans as a stunning upset. Behind the scenes, Funk had pulled out of losing the title to Jack Briscoe, citing injuries in a truck accident. In truth, Amarillo promoter Dory Funk Sr. did not want his son losing the title to a fellow babyface. Harley, a known tough street fighter, was under orders from the NWA to not let Funk leave the ring as champion that night. The ending was a work, with Funk dropping the title in the third fall as planned and Bill Kirsten dropping the Mad Dog nickname during the match. A televised defense from his first reign, held in Calgary against Claude Knight Bill, aired as the main event on an episode of the promotion Stampede Wrestling Program, where Harley successfully defended his title. Though Harley held the title for only a few months, losing it to Briscoe in Houston, Texas, in July he became a worldwide superstar and a headliner everywhere he appeared. Harley was determined to eventually regain the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, often moving between territories and collecting several regional titles, including eight Central States Heavyweight Championships, seven Missouri Heavyweight Championships, the Georgia Heavyweight Championship, the Stampede North American Heavyweight Championship in Canada, the Japan-based NWA United National Heavyweight, and the PWF World Heavyweight Championships, and becoming the first holder of the Mid-Atlantic United States Heavyweight Championship, still defended today as the WWE United States Championship. This kept Harley in contention for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship and Harley vowed that he would only need one chance against a champion to regain it. Harley finally got his wish in 1977, facing familiar rival Terry Funk, who had become the champion since her previous encounters in Toronto. Harley won the title by submission with the Indian Deathlock, a rarely used submission move, but one that put great pressure on Funk's injured leg. The NWA World Heavyweight Champion once again, Harley at this time established his dominance defending the title up to six times a week and holding it for almost five years, excluding extremely short reigns by Tommy Rich, Dusty Rhodes and Giant Baba. Harley feuded with many of the legends of the NWA including Dick the Bruiser, Pat Patterson and Angelo Poffo. In 1978, he had a series of violent matches throughout the Midwest with the Sheik culminating in a bloody 2x4 with a nail in it match in front of 12,000 fans at the Cobo Hall. The NWA and AWA and WWF were all on good terms and Harley engaged in title versus title matches with WWF heavyweight champions superstar Billy Graham and Bob Backlund as well as AWA world heavyweight champion Nick Bockwinkle. Harley toured extensively all over the country and the world including Australia, New Zealand, Singapore and many since in Japan where he was already well known for his visits with Larry Hennig. On October 13, 1978, Harley body slammed Andre the Giant. Harley would repeat the feat on January 7, 1979, though it was outside the ring during the match. Harley, after many victories over Dusty Rhodes and other great wrestlers, lost the title to Rhodes in 1981. Rhodes lost the title to up and coming star Ric Flair. Though Harley was able to defeat Flair in St. Louis in 1983 for his seventh reign as champion, breaking the record previously held by Luthez. What followed was one of the classic angles of the 1980s, which led to the first NWA Starcade event. Determined not to lose a title again, Harley offered a $25,000 bounty to anyone who could eliminate Flair from the NWA. Bob Orton Jr. and Dick Slater attacked Flair, inflicting what appeared to be a career-ending neck injury and collecting the bounty from Harley after Flair announced his retirement. Flair's retirement was a ruse, however, and he eventually returned to action, much to Harley's surprise. NWA officials set up a championship match to be titled Starcade, a Flair for the Gold. The match was to be held in Flair's hometown of Greensboro, North Carolina, which enraged Harley. Harley lost the title to Flair in the bloody and memorable Starcade Steel Cage match, with Gene Kaniski as a special referee. Flair jumped on top of Harley from the top rope and pinned him to become champion. 
Harley regained the NWA World Heavyweight Championship for a two-day reign in New Zealand in 1984. After many years, it is now a recognized title change, but his loss to Flair at Starcade was largely seen as a torch passing from Harley to Flair. Flair would go on to credit Harley for igniting his career. Later, Harley left the NWA because NWA President Sam Muchnick was losing his capabilities. Harley returned to the AWA in 1984 to wrestle Kurt Hennig. The confrontation was fueled by Larry Hennig confronting his former tag team partner at the end of the match. Harley also wrestled former AWA World Heavyweight Champion Rick Martel as part of Wrestle Rock in 1986. Toward the end of his in-ring career, he returned to the AWA, most notably against Larry Zabisco, for an AWA World Heavyweight Championship match in August 1990, which was featured as the main event of an AWA broadcast of ESPN, making it the final AWA television taping. The match ended in a double countout. AWA folded after the match. Early in his career, Harley became involved in the ownership side of wrestling buying a portion of the Kansas City and later St. Louis territories known as Heart of America Sports Attractions. St. Louis was a stronghold for the NWA and around this time in 1984, WWF owner Vince McMahon began his invasion of NWA territories, including St. Louis, his ambition to build a truly national wrestling promotion. Harley was enraged, famously confronting Hulk Hogan and the Funk Brothers at a WWF event in Kansas City. Harley lost over $500,000 as an owner of the Kansas City Territory, and despite his championship years being at an end and wishing to retire from active competition, was forced to rely on continuing to wrestle to make a living. He continued to travel the United States and abroad, and signed with McMahon's WWF in 1986. In May 1986, Harley entered the WWF, managed by longtime friend Bobby the Brain Heenan, bleaching his hair blonde and billing himself again as handsome Harley Race. During a time when the WWF did not recognize the existence of other promotions and the accomplishments a wrestler made there, WWF officials came up with a solution to recognize his wrestling pedigree by having him win the King of the Ring tournament. After this, Harley had a coronation ceremony, coming to the ring in a royal crown and cape to the ceremonial accompaniment of the 10th movement known as the Great Gates of Kiev by Modest Mazorsky. After winning the match, Harley would make his defeated opponent bow and kneel before him. Usually Heenan would assist the defeated opponent to bow and kneel by grabbing their hair and forcing them to bow before Harley. He participated in a notable feud with the Junkyard Dog, culminating in a match at WrestleMania 3 at the Pontiac Silverdome, in which Harley cleanly pinned JYD after a belly-to-belly -belly suplex. JYD was required to bow to Harley as a winner, but after he bowed and Harley got up, JYD attacked him before leaving with the King's cape to a standing ovation. Harley would spend 1987 feuding with Hulk Hogan and Jim Duggan, who during a televised confrontation took Harley's crown and robe, though Harley later attacked Duggan and took them back. His feud with Duggan was highlighted by an extended brawl at the 1987 Slammy Awards. In early 1988, he suffered an injury in a match against Hogan in which he tried to hit Hogan prone on a table at ringside with a swan dive headbutt. Hogan moved out of the way and Harley impacted the table inwards. The metal edge forced its way up to Harley's abdomen, giving him a hernia. Following this incident and during his recovery, the WWF ran an angle where they acknowledged his injury and his manager Heenan vowed to crown a new king. Harley returned in late 1988, joining Heenan's team at Survivor Series. Harley left the WWF in early 1989, following a brief comeback from hernia surgery and an attempt to regain his crown from the new King Haku at the Royal Rumble. In 1990, he divorced his third wife, Yvonne Jones. After leaving the WWF, Harley continued to wrestle until the spring of 1991, most notably with World Wrestling Council in Puerto Rico, Stampede Wrestling in Calgary, the NWA, All Japan and the AWA. He defeated Miguel Perez Jr. for the WWC Caribbean Heavyweight Championship on January 6, 1990 in Puerto Rico, making it his last title reign before dropping it to Jose Gonzalez on March 4th. After his appearance in the AWA, he briefly retired from wrestling. 
Harley made his return at the Great American Bash on July 7, 1990, when he defeated former NWA World Heavyweight Champion Tommy Rich. He began making appearances on host shows and immediately would fill in for Ric Flair in several tag team matches, pairing up with Barry Windham against Lex Luger and Sting. Harley would continue to work a program with Rich through the rest of the summer as well as facing Brian Pillman and Wendell Cooley. In September, he received several United States Heavyweight Championship title shots against the then champion Lex Luger. In October, Harley renewed his rivalry with the Junkyard Dog in two matches on the WCW house show circuit and finished the year facing Michael Wall Street. During a house show in St. Joseph, Missouri on December 7, 1990, Harley sustained a shoulder injury and would ultimately retire from active competition. He transitioned to the role of manager and had success. Harley made his first subsequent appearance six months later as a guest referee during a house show on June 14, 1991 in St. Louis, Missouri. One year after making his initial return on the Great American Bash in 1990, Harley returned at the 1991 Great American Bash to become the advisor slash manager to Lex Luger. Excelling as a manager, as he had as a wrestler, he immediately led Luger to the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. He managed Luger throughout his title run, as well as acquiring the contract for Mr. Hughes from Alexandra, New York. In 1992, Harley began to add other wrestlers to a stable that would include Big Van Vader, Super Invader, and Vinny Vegas. The stable was short-lived, and after Vader defeated Sting for the World Championship on July 12, 1992, he became Harley's primary charge. The wily veteran was popular among the young WCW talent and developed close friendships with Mick Foley and Steve Austin, among others. Harley returned to the ring a final time on a trio of Florida house shows in November of 1993, when he substituted for an injured Vader to face Ric Flair. His former rival would come out victorious on each occasion. These would be the last wrestling matches of his career. After losing the title at Starcade in December 1993, Vader quickly became Harley's sole stable member again. Harley continued to manage Vader in the following months in rematches against Flair, and on May 22, 1994, he was inducted into the WCW Hall of Fame during the Slambury pay-per-view. He continued to appear at Vader's side through the rest of the year. His fourth wife, Beverly, was Vice President of the Commerce Bank of Kansas City. They married in late 1995, shortly after Harley's career-ending car crash. She often traveled with Harley until she died of pneumonia. As his early wrestling career had been nearly derailed due to a car accident, another car accident in January 1995 forced Harley out of the wrestling business altogether. Harley required a hip replacement surgery, which, along with injuries accumulated after years in the ring, prevented him from even being a manager. Harley would make a few independent appearances against Flair, but his inability to work was just too great. Harley would make one last return to WCW television in October 1999 as a ring announcer for the Bret Hart vs. Chris Benoit tribute to Owen Hart match in his hometown of Kansas City. With his in-ring career finished, Harley founded World League Wrestling in 1999 near his home in Eldon. The promotion also served as a training school for the would-be professional wrestlers and other independent promoters from across the region. At present, WLW runs shows in Troy, Missouri. Harley returned to WWE television in 2004, shortly after being inducted into their Hall of Fame. On an episode of Raw, Randy Orton confronted Harley and spat in his face to go with Orton's legend killer persona. Harley returned again for Raw's WWE Homecoming episode in October 2005, marking the show's return to the USA Network. Harley, along with the other legends who were in the ring, gave Rob Conway a lesson in respect. In 2004, Harley was recruited to be part of Total Nonstop Action Wrestling as a member of their NWA Championship Committee. Despite reportedly being an authority figure as a member of the committee, he never made any official decisions and only made the occasional on-screen appearance for the company. At the WWE Hall of Fame Class of 2007 ceremony, Harley and Dusty Rhodes were inducted into the Four Horsemen by Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. On the August 8, 2008 episode of Monday Night Raw, Harley sat in the front row and was acknowledged by commentators Michael Cole and Jerry the King Lawler. Before the show, Harley accompanied GHC heavyweight champion Takeshi Morishima to the ring for a dark match against Charlie Haas. Harley made an appearance at Total Nonstop Action Wrestling's Lockdown Pay-Per-View in 2007 as the special guest gatekeeper for the main event. 
He also made a special guest appearance at the second night of Ring of Honor's Glory of Honor 6, Night 2 at the Manhattan Center on November 3rd, 2007. On January 4th, 2014, Harley took part in New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestling Kingdom 8 in the Tokyo Dome, participating in the title presentation before a match for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship and punching out defending champion Rob Conway's manager Bruce Tharp. Harley continued to run World League Wrestling and his wrestling camp in Eldon, Missouri. He later moved the business to Troy. Many of his trainees were sent to the NOAH promotion in Japan for extra experience. Over the years, he needed surgery to his neck, hip replacements, knee replacements, and had five vertebrae in his back fused together due to the years of taking hard bumps. In May 2017, he broke both his legs at a fall in his home, one in several places. He needed four blood transfusions during surgery. Harley would continue to promote WLW until his death while in rehab. On March 1, 2019, Harley's close friend Ric Flair announced that Harley was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. One day later, CWFH promoter Dave Marquez said that while he was indeed diagnosed with lung cancer, it was not terminal. On August 1, 2019, it was revealed by longtime friend Dustin Rhodes that Harley had died from lung cancer at the age of 76. He was buried next to his parents and one other brother at the Quitman Cemetery along Highway 113 in Quitman, Missouri. During his time, he was considered as one of the toughest men behind the scenes, king of the ring, and the greatest wrestler on God's green earth. He had five grandchildren. Post-career, Harley was inducted into several halls of fame for his achievements. The WCW Hall of Fame, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame, the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame and Museum, the WWE Hall of Fame, the NWA Hall of Fame, the St. Louis Wrestling Hall of Fame, and the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame. That was the story of the King of Wrestling, Harley Race. Brian Christopher Lawler was a professional wrestler who began his career in the late 1980s in Memphis, Tennessee and eventually gaining worldwide recognition when in 1997 he joined the WWF. Although his father, Jerry the King Lawler, was arguably one of the most known wrestlers and the voice of WWF at the time, Brian chose not to use his last name and attempt to carve out his own legacy. But deep down inside, he still wanted to be like his father. Eventually becoming one of the staples of the Attitude Era, joining Scott Taylor to form the tag team Too Much, soon changing their name to Too Cool and adding Rikishi to the mix. As popular as Brian was with fans, he was also well liked in the locker room. As the WWF shifted from the Attitude Era to the Ruthless Aggression Era, many of its stars were forgotten by the company and left to bounce between other promotions in the independent scene. Others fell off the map completely while the WWF focused on creating new stars. Many couldn't cope with being worldwide celebrities one day performing in sold out arenas, making several thousand dollars per week, to making the daily grind of wrestling in bingo halls, high school gyms, and rec centers, sometimes not making enough to pay for gas, food, and a hotel room. Brian made a brief return to the WWF, now called the WWE in 2004, but Brian, like most performers at the time, allowed his extracurricular activities to become a habit. By 2009, his lifestyle began to catch up with him and being arrested was all too common. Over the next nine years, he would be arrested several more times. According to his best friend Terry Teague, Brian believed that police were after him. Having his fair share of run-ins with the law, he believed the arrest started to become personal. In 2018, during a jail stint, he was found unresponsive in a cell and was taken to a local hospital where eventually he was taken off life support. His death was ruled a suicide. But his father Jerry Lawler, as well as many others, including other inmates at the jail, questioned this theory, and even filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the county, as well as the sheriff for failing to protect his son. Many questions still remain around the circumstances surrounding his passing and his final hours. Many believe Brian would not have taken his own life, and reports show the Hardman County Jail to have misreported the cause of death of several other inmates, including Albert Dorsey, who was also found dead in a cell and initially reported as a suicide, but autopsy reports later showed he was murdered. This is the story of Brian Christopher Lawler. It 
it seems it's like a nightmare that we can't wake up from. Um, it seems like every day something new comes up. We hear something from someone that uh, that it was either an eyewitness uh, to to incidents that happened the day that Brian died, or or people that have heard stories about uh, just different things that went on in the jail. At 10:30 that morning, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. I received a phone call from Brian, uh, a collect call that's monitored and recorded, and um, it's timed. 15 minutes is all you could talk at the time. And so uh, that morning, though, he talked perfectly rational, perfectly normal, uh, just went on a little bit about how uh, we had had a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago with the sheriff there. And uh, Brian just went on about how none of the stuff that the sheriff had promised uh, would take place had taken place. And that there's just, uh, uh, you know, he just talked about the bad conditions there in the jail. Then. Um, we could do. We got cut off mid sentence after 15 minutes, and uh, didn't hear anything until about 2:30 in the afternoon. Well, actually, I spoke with the sheriff and said that Brian had been involved in an altercation with another inmate. There was a fight, and uh, the sheriff's actual words were, "Brian was acting a fool and picked a fight with somebody that he shouldn't have picked a fight with," uh, and then he got some got a, a laceration over his eye, and that they stitched him up, and he was fine. Of course, we heard later on from an eyewitness uh, to that fight that it went nothing like what the sheriff said. Then, uh, you know, then a few hours later, uh, we get a call. I, I got another call there in, in uh, Raleigh uh, from a deputy sheriff that said, Mr. Lawler, I've got some bad news. Your son, Brian, has hung himself in the jail. So it was just, you know, the, the, from what talking to Brian earlier in the day and then hearing about the incident uh, in the afternoon and then all the way to the fact that you know, he was he was gone that evening. It just it just doesn't add up. And so many of the uh, eyewitnesses that have spoken to us and, and got in touch with us, uh, their the, the stories just don't jive. Brian Christopher was the first son to Jerry and Kay Lawler and was born on January 10, 1972. The couple would later have another son, Kevin. Being a professional wrestler and an international star, Jerry was on the road most of the time, which left little time to dedicate to his family. Like most professional athletes, his marriage took a backseat and eventually him and Kay divorced around 1978. By age 6, Brian was only seeing his father a few times a year due to his schedule. Eventually, him and his brother started going to the matches at the Mid-South Coliseum each week just to see his father. He and his brother would get to talk to him for a few minutes each week between promos and matches. Brian attended Craigmont High School, where he was a sophomore class officer, as well as a member of the football team. In 1984, Brian made his first on-camera appearance in his father's parody video to the Ghostbusters theme song called Wimp Busters. While he was a junior in high school, they were staging wrestling matches at his high school gym, being promoted by someone he knew. One night, he says the wrestling was so pitiful that he had talked smack backstage about how he could do a better job than them, and someone told him to put up or shut up. He and his friend took the guy's challenge and had a tag team match. He showed a tape of the match to his father, who at that point never realized his son wanted to be in the business, and was told that he could do matches on the weekend while still in high school, as long as he got wrestling gear that covered his entire body and wore a mask. He was never formally trained. He'd watched a lot of matches over the years, so he'd try stuff he'd seen before. Once he got into the business, Dr. Tom Pritchard and others taught him the psychology of the ring. Brian officially started his professional wrestling career in 1989. From the start of his career, Brian never used his real last name. He stated he didn't use a Lawler name because he wanted to make a name for himself instead of having the stigma of, oh, he's so-and-so's kid, or he's only there because of his old man, but still claimed no one could ever fill his father's shoes and still looked at Jerry as being one of the best in the business. He began his career as one half of the mass tag team The Twilight Zone with Tony Williams under the individual ring names of Nebula and Quasar. After they were unmasked, Brian continued to wrestle in the United States Wrestling Association under the name Too Sexy Brian Christopher. He feuded with wrestlers such as Jeff Jarrett, Bill Dundee, 
Tom Pritchard, the Moondogs, and even his own father, Jerry Lawler. Among his partners were Tony Williams, eventually known as the New Kids, and would even change the ring music to Hang and Tough by the New Kids on the Block. He would also team briefly with Doug Gilbert, Scotty Flamingo, and Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. He would also tag with Flex Cavana during Flex's first ever televised match, as well as help him out in the ring. Flex would go on to be known as Rocky Maivia and later The Rock. The two would remain close friends throughout their careers. In 1997, he joined the WWF and began competing in the light heavyweight division. Taka Michinoku defeated him in the finals of a tournament for the light heavyweight championship. His father, Jerry Lawler, would talk him up as being superior to all the other light heavyweights, but never publicly acknowledged Brian was his son. Although Paul Heyman revealed that fact on Raw, Jim Ross always hinted at it. Often a running joke that someone, usually a commentator, would mention their relationship, which led to them both adamantly denying they were related. In 1998, he started teaming with Scott Too Hot Taylor to form the tag team Too Much. He injured his knee in a tag match against D'Lo Brown due to an enziguri spot gone wrong. When he was examined, it turned out his ACL was torn in half and tore up his meniscus in both knees. The infamous Dr. Andrews, who at that point just performed surgery involving Triple H's knee, claims it was the worst knee injury he had ever seen. He claimed to have trained 8 hours a day, resulting in the fourth quickest recovery in the history of that injury. The too cool gimmick had just made its debut the night before he blew out his knee. He credited the idea for the gimmick to Vince Russo. In May of 2001, Brian, while flying to Canada for a WWF show, was arrested at the Calgary airport for possession of weed, cocaine, and speed. Although he was only issued a fine and charged as a misdemeanor, his WWF contract was terminated because of the incident. His last match for the company was on SmackDown at the Arrowhead Pond in Anaheim, California, when he teamed with Steve Blackman and Trish Stratus in a mixed tag match defeating the right to censor, Bull Buchanan, Ivory, and The Good Father. Throughout the next several months, he would bounce between independent promotions, wrestling in the USA, and MCW Pro Wrestling. Later that year, while trying to pick up the pieces of his crumbling career, he wrestled in the United Kingdom and Ireland for World Wrestling All-Stars. On February 24, 2002, at the WWA pay-per-view The Revolution in the United States, Brian wrestled WWA Heavyweight Champion Jeff Jarrett for the title but lost. In April 2002, at the WWA pay-per-view The Eruption in Australia, he teamed with Ernest the Cat Miller to defeat Buff Bagwell and Stevie Ray. The next year, things started looking up for Brian. From 2002 until 2003, he worked for TNA Total Nonstop Action as Brian Lawler. He formed a group called Next Generation with fellow second generation stars David Flair and Eric Watts. They were involved in a rivalry with Dusty Rhodes and harassed him with a replica of the NWA world title belt that he wore when he was champion. In April 2004, he returned to the WWF, now calling itself the WWE, as Grandmaster Sexay, when Jerry Lawler was the head of talent relations. But he was released the following month when John Laurinaitis took over for Lawler's position. In September of 2007, he appeared on the television program Anderson Cooper 360 concerning the double murder and suicide involving Chris Benoit. On June 26, 2.45 a.m., police were dispatched to a Circle K store in reference to an intoxicated person. When police arrived, they found Brian, who was very unsteady on his feet and had slurred speech, the report said. Once he was taken into custody, Brian became very belligerent, cursed an officer, and told him once the handcuffs were off, he was going to rip the officer's head off. The report said Brian was taken into custody for his own safety due to his high level of intoxication. The store clerk told officers she saw Brian fall over the outside Coke cooler causing $200 in damage. Brian pled guilty and was fined $50 plus court costs, and was also given the choice between serving 30 days in jail or 30 days in an inpatient treatment center. 
Initially, Brian chose the inpatient treatment, but didn't make it to the treatment center before his next court date. He was subsequently taken into custody and served 30 days in jail instead. This was his second arrest of the year. On April 12, 2013, court documents showed Brian was stopped by officers in the early morning hours of April 11th after failing to stop at an intersection. Police reported he admitted to drinking more than half a liter of vodka and taking methadone and Xanax. Officers said he was unable to complete the alphabet during his field sobriety test. He was again arrested and taken into custody. The year 2018 started badly for Brian. Brian was badly injured after a fight with Jonathan Ryan Clark, aka Chase Stevens, in Evansville, Indiana. Clark was arrested and charged with battery, causing serious bodily injury. In the March issue of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave Meltzer reported that Brian suffered a fractured skull, broken nose, broken orbital bone, and had teeth knocked out. Brian was reportedly intoxicated when police found him in the hotel lobby. The fight took place in Steven's hotel room. The observer noted that it could have been even worse, however employees at the hotel heard the commotion and stepped in. It was noted that Clark was a Golden Gloves boxing champion. Days after the fight, a GoFundMe was created for Brian, which stated that he suffered a bad home incident in Memphis that left him with several broken bones. The GoFundMe was set up by Mike Dickinson, who was Brian's manager. However, it was eventually deleted. Brian was again arrested Tuesday, June 5, 2018, in the early morning after allegedly not paying for a hotel room. According to the police report, Brian and another man, Terry Teague, checked into the Hampton Inn on Peabody Place using a company credit card. The next day it was discovered the card didn't have sufficient funds. Both men said they didn't have money to pay for the room and were arrested. They were charged with theft of services. After the arrest, Brian maintained he had never stolen anything in his life. But the question still remains why the hotel would issue keys to a room without payment being made first. And when a credit card is used, it wouldn't authorize in the first place unless funds were available. The hotel refused to comment. According to an interview conducted by News Channel 3 in Memphis, Teague says that what looks like a smiling mugshot has much more meaning. We got to the jail and I heard the jailers tell him, Lawler, law enforcement is going to kill you. Brian was just smiling. Teague says Lawler believed police were after him. Lawler had his fair share of run-ins with the law, but believed the arrest started to become personal. During an interview, Jerry would comment, At one point, Brian's wife, Dava, attempted to stage an intervention. It was like having a surprise birthday party for someone who didn't like birthday parties, Lawler said. His mom was crying, his wife was crying, and he was shaking his head like, I don't know why you think it's so bad. He didn't think he had a problem. Despite his ability to double talk and charm, it was obvious Brian was struggling. Jerry also spent thousands of dollars on treatment for his son. Nothing appeared to work. He left one program because the Steelers game was on and they weren't showing it at the rehab center. It just wasn't sinking in. He told me, I've been through this too many times. Rehab doesn't work. Here's a guy who had $300,000 in the bank a beautiful house, a beautiful wife, a child, and he lost everything one by one. He couldn't understand why everyone was so concerned about him. On July 7, 2018, Sergeant Chris Wilkerson of the Hardman County Sheriff's Department said that he noticed a vehicle traveling south on Highway 1255 at speeds above the posted limit. The vehicle failed to maintain proper lane control, the police report said. When the officer attempted to conduct a traffic stop, he said that Brian kept going, making a left onto his driveway. After he caught up with him, Mr. Lawler had the odor of an intoxicant about his person and an open 12-ounce can in the center console, the report said, but the report didn't say what was in the can. A standard field sobriety test, according to the document, suggested Brian was impaired. But Brian would tell his father and brother another version of the incident, insisting that on this night he hadn't been drinking at all. Because of this, he claimed he made a deal with the sergeant. Give me a breathalyzer and if I blow a zero, I can go home. The police report states that Brian blew a .000 per 210 liters of breath. Regardless, he was taken to the Hardman County Jail and charged with DUI, evading arrest, and driving with a revoked license. As he was being booked, Brian told his father one of the deputies leaned in and pointed at Wilkerson. You know how your father is a king of wrestling? The officer allegedly said. Well, that guy over there is a king of DUIs. 
When you get a DUI from him, he makes it stick, suggesting innocence or guilt doesn't matter to Sergeant Chris Wilkerson, who according to his LinkedIn profile went from assistant manager at Blockbuster Video to a patrol officer. In 2015, he was promoted to a police sergeant, then a few short years later demoted back to a patrol officer. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation's toxicology report would determine that no illicit drugs had been detected in Brian's bloodstream. However, there were traces of oxycodone and oxymorphone. Jerry's lawyer, Jeff Rosenblum, attributed this to Brian's legal medications for chronic pain, his knee injury, anxiety, and depression. The attorney described the amount of opiates as most consistent with what you would expect in a person who is taking medication prescribed by a doctor. Although mental health professionals visited the facility while Brian was there, the lawsuit states, none stopped to evaluate him. When Brian was arrested, Jerry drove to the county jail in Boulevard, Tennessee. Upon entering the building, he was greeted by grinning correctional officers asking for autographs and selfies. It was like a personal appearance, he said. Jerry felt like a father struggling to choose the best course of action for a kid with substance abuse issues. It didn't matter that this particular kid was 46 years old. Brian's behavior had given Jerry every indication that his son couldn't be responsible for himself. Once Jerry got inside the jail and talked to Brian, he started to feel a little better. Sheriff John Doolin joined their conversation and reminded Brian that they had met a year or so earlier. Bond had been set and bond could have been made and the decision was not to make the bond because of the promises and assurances made by Sheriff Doolin to Jerry Lawler that he would protect his son and make sure that he got some help for the alcohol and drug addiction issues that had been plaguing Brian. Jerry had come to the jail to bond out his son, but now he had second thoughts. When Brian returned to his cell, Jerry and Doolin spoke. It was pointless to bring Brian home. Jerry claims that the sheriff told him since a younger man was scheduled for a court appearance next week, at which time he'd be sentenced to a mandatory 90 days for DUI and evading arrest, the days spent behind bars would count as time served. He told me this is the safest place for Brian too because we will get him the help that he needs. I'll personally look out for Brian. Brian will be safe in here. So Jerry made the fatal decision. He told Doolin to leave Brian in custody. I was hoping staying in jail would mean he finally got help, Jerry said. That's when the sheriff promised that they had a rehab program in jail. But Brian was never treated for drug and alcohol or mental health issues at the Hardman County Jail. On July 28, 2018, hours after allegedly getting sucker punched in a jailhouse fight and placed in solitary, Brian was allegedly found hanging in a cell. Ever since then, Jerry had been asking questions. First, whether his son was murdered behind bars and strung up to cover up the crime. Then, why a person with Brian's fertilities was placed in a cell with bolts protruding from the wall and allowed to keep shoelaces that could be used to hurt himself. Jerry believes that Doolin's pledge to protect Brian was a con. But there was another side of Brian Christopher that the fans didn't see. Brian had been diagnosed with a major depression disorder. The Brian you saw on television worked hard to be that Brian because he was managing depression. Behind bars, Brian was not able to receive his medication for depression, just ibuprofen for his chronic pain, Rosenblum said. For three weeks, the lawyer claimed, Brian was denied his other medications and was experiencing withdrawal. Brian called me on the phone, collect call from the jail, and Brian said, Dad, Sheriff Doolin lied. He said, I haven't had any help. On Saturday, July 28th, Brian was playing cards in the day room when one particular inmate, Tamarian Williams, incarcerated on a parole violation, apparently demanded that he lower his voice. Punches were thrown. Brian was famous for this, Jerry said. Brian would always fight. During the scuffle, Brian applied a reverse chin lock on Williams and was backed into the wall, witnesses said, while Brian's government-issued drawstring orange pants slipped down. According to the accounts, Williams eventually shouted for Brian to stop. When he did, Brian bent over to catch his breath and pull up his pants. That's when the other inmates said Williams sucker-punched Brian, leaving a one-and-a-half-inch gash along his left eyebrow. Rosenblum said that Brian shouted that he had a concussion and needed stitches and asked to be taken to the hospital. 
Instead, Jill Sheeran, a licensed practical nurse, applied a bandage before Brian was placed alone in an administrative holding cell, according to the attorney. This is not a decision that should be made by an LPN, Rosenblum said. They should have called a doctor or advanced practice nurse, described the wound and mentioned that he wanted stitches. But he was told, it's Saturday, you'll have to wait till Monday. He was put in a solitary confinement cell without evaluating him for suicide risk. Because the video surveillance system at the jail allegedly didn't work, Rosenblum said, no one knows exactly what transpired while Brian was alone in his cell. At approximately 6.30 p.m., correctional officer William Gonzalez walked by the chamber and, according to the lawsuit, observed Brian standing on the bench with a towel over his face, said Rosenblum. If he was standing on the bench, he hadn't stepped off yet. If you got him 30 seconds earlier, he would have lived. Gonzalez left to throw out the garbage, the lawsuit said. When he returned, he saw what he thought was Brian standing on the bench, still with a towel over his head. Gonzalez called Sergeant Judy Wiggins for assistance. They realized Brian had tried to hang himself. Still alive, Brian was airlifted to Regional One Medical Center in Memphis. Jerry was at a comic convention in Raleigh the day Brian allegedly hung himself. He was stunned and in shock when he heard the news. At first he assumed Brian was dead until he was told he had a faint pulse and was taken to the hospital to be put on life support. He tried to arrange a flight out for that night but there was none. Jerry was in a bad state of mind but got in touch with WWE to get a flight. In the meantime, Brian had been transferred to the Memphis hospital. A flight back to Memphis had been arranged for Jerry. Brian was on life support as well as several medications for keeping his blood pressure stable. When Jerry arrived, his ex-wife Kay was at the hospital with family. Doctors had explained to Jerry that the life support was keeping Brian alive. Jerry was very upset over seeing the condition of Brian and told the doctor he didn't want to be put in the position of having to unplug him from the machine. Then Brian's blood pressure started to drop and would eventually bottom out. Jerry held Brian's hand as he slipped away. At 3.49 p.m. on July 29, 2018, Brian Christopher Lawler was pronounced dead. Instinctively, Jerry snapped a photo of his son's lifeless body and texted it to Sheriff Doolin. I told him I trusted you and believed you when you told me my son would be safe in your jail, and now he's dead, Jerry said. Doolin texted back, I'm sorry for your loss. Hurts my heart to know how Brian decided to check out, The Rock posted on Instagram. I never knew him to be suicidal, but I guess sometimes the pain gets too much for one to take. I'll miss you man and the times we had. Thanks for being a great friend. Thanks for being my boy. Jerry Lawler was initially cynical about the notion that his son has taken his own life. He suspected that Brian had been killed in a fight and hung up to cover the assault. The words of my attorney, there's so much smoke that has come out of that uh, Bolivar jail that there's got to be fire somewhere. His theory was based on more than paranoia. In the photo taken at the hospital, Brian was wearing an oxygen mask while brown marks covered around the back of his head and the sides of his neck, stopping just before the throat area. To Jerry, the space in front of the neck looked like to be the size of a fist, Rosenblum said. So Jerry questioned whether Brian was fighting while others were trying to strangle him. Earlier in the month, Doolin had sued Harbin County Mayor Jimmy Sane, claiming that the department was understaffed and that seven of the jail's 27 employees were paid so poorly that they had no choice but to go on public assistance. The sheriff said put both staff and the public safety at risk. Jerry did not believe Brian died by suicide. On his podcast, Jerry opened up that week's episode saying he wanted to vent a little bit. He would go on to say, A lot of people have expressed. I have doubts as to whether Brian really did commit suicide. We've been contacted by inmates that were in the jail with Brian that said they don't believe what was told is actually what happened. We just want to know what really actually happened. Right now there's a lot of doubt and a lot of questions that are going to have to be answered in the next few months. Jerry would also comment, you may say, hey, you don't want to face the inevitable, but we've been contacted by another person who witnessed. I shouldn't say any more because this investigation is ongoing and it may take a long time for this to all get sorted out. My attorney just looked at this and his exact words were, Jerry, this doesn't pass a smell test. Something seems not right about this whole thing. Jerry brought up Brian's personal issues, which included multiple run-ins with the law, but has never known his son to be suicidal. He knew he needed help and wanted to help, Jerry said. Once he got straightened out, that's what he wanted to spend his time doing, working with other people who were in the same boat as Brian. 
You lay awake at night thinking what could have been done differently. How do we get to this point? What could have really happened? It's hard to go to sleep when all that's on your mind. In the lawsuit, Jerry alleges that Sheriff John Doolin had promised him that Brian would receive support regarding his addiction issues while incarceration, before going on to allege that the promise was broken and he feels betrayed by Doolin. Jerry Lawler is seeking $3 million in damages and any other damages the court sees fit to award. He is also seeking a court order forcing Hardeman County to make changes to prevent any further incidents similar to what happened with Brian. According to experts who examined the photos of Brian's neck, the marks were not consistent with someone who had hung themselves, as well as the marks on Brian's hands, resembled self-defense wounds as though he was trying to protect himself from being strangled. I think they were strangling him, said Terry Teague, Brian's best friend. I think they had him down in his holding cell, and they were strangling him and he was fighting for his life. Teague said he's not buying the suicide story because Brian saved him from suicide twice. He talked me out of it, Teague said. Again, he told me, listen, Look at life from outside the box. He also goes on to say he loves himself too much to take his own life. He told me straight up. He said, man, if I ever died, don't let them say it was a suicide. He said, because here's the thing. Even if nobody else in this world loves me, I love myself enough not to take my own life. That's why Teague says everyone inside the jail should be investigated. In a Facebook post by Teague, he posted a screenshot of a text he received from Brian on June 28th where he told his friend among his three biggest fears in life, the first one was the police killing me and getting away with it. With someone who has also had their fair share of run-ins with the law, Terry Teague would have nothing to gain by going public with these allegations, but on the contrary, risking his own personal well-being. This wasn't the first time Sheriff John Doolin was named in a lawsuit for negligence and failing to provide proper medical treatment for somebody in his custody. On January 29, 2013, Nelson Jenkins also named Doolin in a lawsuit. According to court documents, Jenkins had been diagnosed with pancreatitis and was receiving regular medical treatment that properly controlled his condition. After he arrived at the jail, he completed a medical history form and advised jail officials of his ailment. While in the defendant's custody, he repeatedly complained of bodily pain and his need to be seen by a physician for his pancreatitis. His requests were ignored or refused and on one occasion, Jenkins was told by Doolin that we can't take you to the doctor. Plaintiff continued to be severely ill for several weeks. At some point he was taken to the jail nurse who provided him with over-the-counter pain medication. His condition continued to deteriorate, resulting in an inability to eat and his feet turning black. At some point thereafter, Jenkins lost consciousness and woke up in a Jackson, Tennessee hospital. Many accuse a private prison in West Tennessee routinely putting profits over the well-being of its prisoners. Brian was not the first to experience this, nor was he the last. Hardeman County Correctional Facility officers found Albert Dorsey unresponsive in his cell on September 14, 2021. Less than an hour later, he was pronounced dead. Dorsey's death was also first called in as a suicide, according to the county medical examiner's report. He was in his cell alone and no one else had access, according to the notes scrawled in the report's margins. In this instance, cameras in the institution also, conveniently, weren't working. According to Dorsey's autopsy report, he was murdered. An investigation is ongoing. Auditors also found that the jail improperly identified the official cause of death for 8 of 38 inmates who died in custody between 2017 and 2019. The department's ability to provide accurate, and complete information relating to deaths and other serious incidents is problematic, the audit stated. A Jackson Sun review of five years of data reveals that even when controlled for similar inmate populations, the homicide rate at the privately run Tennessee prison is more than twice the homicide rate of prisons run by the Tennessee Department of Corrections. According to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, it has wrapped up its investigation. Representative Kelly McAllister released the following statement. Our investigation has concluded. 
on all findings have been turned over to District Attorney General Mark Davidson. I will have to refer any questions to his office, says McAllister. According to people who knew Brian, he never touched drugs before going to the WWF. Like many other performers, trying to keep up with high demands placed on them by the company can be next to impossible without some type of medication. Constantly living in fear that missing a show due to being injured might cost your job. Countless wrestlers from the Attitude Era have unfortunately passed away with a high percentage of the deaths being preventable. To the WWF, which posts hundreds of millions of dollars in profits each year, suicides, drug overdoses and other preventable deaths have been all too common and even accepted by the company, who has proven time and time again they are willing to risk their talent's well-being to enhance profits. Brian was a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan and was well known for the red wagon he would bring to the ring in his early career to carry his multiple title belts. He was just 46 years old and is survived by his son Blake, mother Martha K. Williams, his brother Kevin, and father Jerry the King Lawler, as well as dozens of brothers and sisters in the crazy quasi fraternity called professional wrestling. Lance Cade, born Lance McNaught in Carroll, Iowa, was a professional wrestler who spent most of his career with the WWE and its developmental promotions, as well as a handful of tours to Japan. As a graduate of the Shawn Michaels Wrestling Academy in 1999, he briefly worked for Frontier Martial Arts in the first year of his career, and in 2001 would sign with the WWE. Throughout the next couple of years, he would continue improving his craft in its developmental territory, Ohio Valley Wrestling. But being skilled in the ring would prove not to be enough to reach the next level of his career. When it came to his physical appearance, Lance didn't fit into the stereotypical bodybuilder look that became a requirement in the WWE and was pressured to use steroids in order to fit in. He made his on-camera debut in 2003 and by June of that year was promoted to the Raw brand under the ring name Garrison Cade. Over the next five years, he became a regular on the main roster, teaming with both Trevor Murdoch and Chris Jericho, and becoming a three-time tag team champion. In 2008, he suffered a seizure on a plane, requiring emergency medical care. Lance, like many other performers in the WWE, would rely on a cocktail of prescription medications, as well as performance enhancers, in order to meet the high demands placed on them by the company. Realizing he had a problem, he eventually reached out to the company and took advantage of their wellness policy, which offered to pay for rehab to any performer past or present, suffering from addiction. Six weeks later, he was released from his WWE contract. Many fans believe the WWE acted too harsh on Lance. He was rehired by the company in 2009, appearing in one of its developmental territories, Florida Championship Wrestling, but was released in 2010 without returning to the main roster. In August of that year, Lance passed away at the age of 29, reported as an accidental drug overdose. At the same time, Linda McMahon was deep in her campaign run to become U.S. Senator. Among several other controversies during her crusade, when asked about Lance's untimely passing, she would go on to say the WWE had no more responsibility for its talent than the studio Heath Ledger worked for at the time of his death. She would also downplay their relationship and was quoted as saying she didn't really know him and might have met him once. According to Lance's father Harley, he witnessed Linda having interactions with Lance at more than one WWE event and was furious by her comments. As well felt Linda disrespected Lance and his entire family. During an interview, Christopher Nowinski described Linda's comments as kicking dirt on his grave. As a publicly traded company, history shows corporate profits typically come before the well-being of their performers. With a career that picked up steam so quickly, no one was expecting Lance's death to arrive so abruptly. This is a story of Lance Cade. Original wrestling documentaries. What the world has come to. You knew Lance Cade, yes? Yes. And uh, he dies this week, not the first death in your former profession or whatever you call it. Aberrational or part of a pattern? No, certainly part of a pattern. I mean, he had a drug addiction to painkillers. 
He was a steroid user. I mean, I remember seeing him, last time I saw him was at the Garden in Boston. Uh, he was in catering and he said, you know, I wish I had a gimmick like yours. Me, me being the Ivy League guy, I could just talk. I didn't have to have a big steroid body. So he said, so I could stop using these steroids. And he also said, because the pressure is to use them because the WWE rewards the guys who use them. Now, do the people who run the WWE, they know all this is going on? Do they encourage all this? You know, I mean, they absolutely know what's going on. Linda McMahon is quoted in the last couple of days as saying, uh, I should be held no more accountable than a studio which failed to prevent Heath Ledger's death, obviously from a drug overdose in 08. What kind of response do you have to that? That's a, a complete garbage. And when I read that, that's one of the reasons I agreed to talk about this. I haven't been talking about this. For the guys I knew, when she says, well, I, her quote in the paper was, I might have met Lance once. It's just, I mean, just kicking dirt on the guy's grave. They have an environment where it's absolutely unsafe to work in that ring. They have no oversight into what actually happens in the ring, and they are encouraging steroid use. It gives you an enlarged heart, which is why guys are dying from heart failure. They're taking painkillers because they're working 200 nights a, a year and getting hit, unlike anyone in the history of the wrestling business. It wasn't like that in the 80s. It wasn't like that in the 70s. You're falling. I and mean, I used to go through tables uh, for four, four, four days a week. So I'll put words. Linda McMahon is completely full of it when she says what she says about either not knowing or that this is like a studio. I mean, a studio doesn't, it's not part of their deal to uh, have their actors taking drugs. It is part of what you do to succeed or did, yes? Uh, it's part of what some of the guys do to succeed. And also, you. Well, if you are an actor, you have stunt people that prevent you from getting permanent injuries. When I found his body, it was the worst day of my life. No parent should ever have to make funeral arrangements for their own child. It's just not right. He was only 29. He had his whole life ahead of him. The McMahon family and that whole WWE circus needs to be investigated. You can say wellness policy this or that, but until a tragedy happens, no one even cares. These men and women travel on the road with no off-season or time to let their bodies heal, and all the company cares about is profits. How many of their wrestlers have died in the last five or ten years? Not to mention the families and kids they leave behind. Lance was a father. He had two beautiful daughters and a stepson, who are always going to grow up asking, why did my daddy have to die so young? I'll tell you that Linda or Vince McMahon would be acting a lot different if they got a phone call and it was Shane or Stephanie laying in the morgue. Lance was born on March 2, 1981, in Carroll, Iowa, to Harley and Jay McNaught. From the first time he saw Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair in action, he became a lifelong wrestling fan and knew instantly that's what he wanted to do. He was a standout athlete and excelled in many sports he tried from golf to basketball. By the time he was 12 or 13 years old, he was already making local newspapers. Lance attended Millard North High School and already over six feet was an obvious choice for the basketball team. He was the best player they had and helped them win many games, but couldn't get wrestling off his mind. In high school, he was on the basketball team. He was already six foot four, but ever since he was old enough to talk, all he would talk about is wrestling. While spending his days training in the weight room with the football team, he made up his mind that's what he wanted to do, either become a basketball player or a pro wrestler. With offers from several colleges for scholarships on the table, Lance found out about Shawn Michaels Wrestling School and declined them all, and at 18, he packed his bags and moved to San Antonio, Texas, where he would train alongside future WWE stars Daniel Bryan and Brian Kendrick. Lance immediately caught the attention of Shawn Michaels as a potential star for the future. He was an 18-year-old kid who stood 6'5 and had the look Vince McMahon looked for in a top star. I don't regret his decision to become a wrestler, because that was his dream from childhood. He loved the business. Daniel Bryan talked about Lance Cade in his book. Lance caught Sean's eye from the very beginning. He was a big guy from Nebraska, tall, muscular, and athletic. He was good looking too, with his long blonde hair, and only 18 at the time. That first day of training, 
Among all the calisthenics and rolls, we also did something involving jumping. Lance could jump to the moon, and when Sean saw him jump so high, he immediately said in front of everyone, I smell money. It was clear that Lance was one of Sean's early favorites. Alongside Shawn Michaels, Lance also would receive training from Rudy Gonzalez and the legendary Jose Lothario. Lance was at the top of his class and would make his in-ring debut in Shawn's local promotion, Texas Wrestling Alliance, where he started out as a planted fan interfering in matches. When Bruce Pritchard came down to the school to scout talent for the WWF, he signed four students from the class, Shooter Schultz, Brian Kendrick, Daniel Bryan, and Lance. According to Bruce Pritchard, Lance was very quiet and shy and would second guess and overanalyze everything. He never really connected with the fans. He was great in the ring and had the look that looked like he should be the champion, but unfortunately just overanalyzed everything. Lance would go to Japan with Daniel Bryan who was now calling himself the American Dragon. There they would work together as a tag team. The next month, Daniel Bryan left Japan and headed back to the United States. Lance returned to the United States and went back to the Texas Wrestling Academy, where he won the TV Championship title. He left Texas Wrestling Academy in June of 2000 and went to Memphis Championship Wrestling, where he would have several matches with Daniel Bryan, who was still calling himself the American Dragon. In August of 2001, he was sent to Heartland Wrestling Association, which at the time was a developmental promotion for the WWE run by Les Thatcher. There he formed a team with Mike Sanders and became a three-time Heartland Wrestling Tag Team Champion and a two-time Heartland Wrestling Heavyweight Champion. On June 22, 2002, Lance wrestled a dark match at a WWE Raw house show where he defeated Johnny Stamboli. Backstage during a meeting with Jim Ross, Lance was told he needed to work on his upper body and again felt pressure to use performance enhancement drugs as making the main roster was a dream of Lance's since he was a little kid. Jim Ross liked Lance both as a person and as a performer. Unlike Bruce Pritchard, Jim Ross could see the potential Lance had and the star he could be. World Wrestling Entertainment was ending their agreement with Heartland Wrestling and withdrew all their signed developmental talent. Lance was one of those wrestlers. His last match for HWA was in July of 2002 when he lost the heavyweight title to Cody Hawk. Lance then went to Ohio Valley Wrestling and continued to fine tune his craft. He teamed with Rene Dupree and they became a tag team stable known as Bolin Services with Kenny Bolin as their manager. Lance and Dupree fought for an opportunity for the OVW tag team titles, both against Bradshaw in a handicap match and against the APA, but came up short. On November 11th of 2002, he would make another WWE appearance during a dark match on Sunday Night Heat when he teamed with Charlie Haas defeating Chris Canyon and Danny Basham. Jim Ross was impressed with Lance's progress and dedication to the business and was heavily praised for his performance, but was told he still needed to build his body. He began making regular appearances on WWE Raw house shows as well as Heat. With only a few hours notice, Lance was told that because he would be facing Lance Storm, he would have to change his name that he had been using for four years at that point. Lance was not thrilled about the moniker change, but trying to be a team player and willing to make any sacrifice required for his career, he reluctantly changed his name. On June of 2003, Lance wrestled his first televised Raw show against Lance Storm, wrestling as Garrison Cade. As Storm got the upper hand, he was interrupted by Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold stood under the Titan Tron calling Storm boring throughout the match. Throughout June and July, he would have several matches against Storm and even form a short-lived tag team with Tough Enough winner Maven. Lance managed to reach the big stage of the WWE in a very short time and seemed to have a promising career ahead of him. He would then form a team with Mark Jindrak and have several matches against the Dudley Boys. They would remain a team for the rest of 2003 and until March of the next year. Lance would begin wrestling more as a singles performer, but also form several short-lived tag teams teaming with Chuck Palumbo, Johnny Nitro, and even Jonathan Coachman. WWE wasn't sure what to do with Lance. As great as a performer he was in the ring, 
Fans were still unable to connect with his persona and he was sent back to OVW to work on his character. He was called back up for a Sunday Night Heat dark match on July 18, 2005 where he teamed with Trevor Rhodes who would change his name to Trevor Murdoch because of his uncanny resemblance to the veteran Dick Murdoch. The next night during a WWE Raw house show, him and Murdoch would defeat Chris Cage and The Miz and would again be known as Lance Cade. Lance and Murdoch not only had chemistry in the ring, but outside as well. The two quickly became close friends and traveling with one another. WWE immediately noticed how well they worked together. Lance played the role of a smooth-talking cowboy, while Murdoch was depicted as an angry southern trucker. Over the next three years, the two would capture the tag team titles on three separate occasions. In an exclusive interview with Slam Wrestling, Trevor Murdoch spoke about his partner and best friend Lance. Murdoch's wife called Lance the other woman, since they spent so much time together and would call each other on days off as well, eager to discuss ideas they had for their characters. 90% of the time, it was just me and him, Murdoch said. If I got to a town before he did, I'd wait for him, and we'd get a rental car. If he got there before me, he would wait for me. It was a strong partnership, and not just a partnership, but a friendship. Initially, Lance was asked to choose between Murdoch, fresh from Harley Race's wrestling school, and Kevin Thorne, who he had known in the WWE's developmental system. Murdoch's unique look appealed to Lance, and they clicked sharing a deep passion for the business. Murdoch would go on to say, WWE thought they were putting two guys together so they could make a million dollars. What they didn't know is they were putting two guys together that became best friends. Upon teaming up, Murdoch and Lance quickly won the WWE World Tag Team Championship. But politics and physical attributes led to some up and down booking in their respective careers. Murdoch explained how their title run was pulled away for no reason and didn't get an explanation at the time but noted they had later found out it was due to an argument with the head producer. Later on, Murdoch said he and Lance were pulled off television, and while they kept throwing out ideas to WWE to bring themselves back, they continued to be rejected. When asking for an explanation why, Murdoch said the writing team told him it was due to Vince McMahon and a particular issue related to the duo's appearance. Murdoch would go on, We sat down with Vince, Lance on one side, I'm on the other, and we just asked him outright, the writers are throwing ideas at you, we're throwing ideas at you and you keep shooting us down. What is it that you're not happy with when it comes to us? And he pulled down his glasses, looked at both of us, and he looked at Lance, who had black hair at the time, and he goes, I hate your fake black hair. And he looked at me and he goes, I don't like your pasty white skin. The next day, I'm tan and my partner's got bleached blonde hair. Sure enough, Vince gets a picture of it, next week we're on TV. On December 28, 2007, Lance separated his shoulder at a house show in Atlanta and was inactive for the next month. His painkiller addiction began to kick in full force as a constant fear of losing his spot in the main roster forced him to return much sooner than he should have. Lance had been injured on the job, requiring surgery on a shoulder in 2009 and receiving a prescription for a knee injury in 2004. Once you try to climb the ladder and get a spot, you shut it down due to an injury, and you lose your spot and go right back down to the bottom. So it's here, take a few painkillers, make the world go away. After injuries, use of painkillers just came too easy to Lance because it took the pain away. The use of the painkillers made it like he was in La La Land. He would just kind of pass out. Lance made his return teaming with Murdoch on the February 4th episode of Raw in a losing effort to Bob Hawley and Cody Rhodes. In April of 2008, Trevor Murdoch began to develop a country singing gimmick. On the May 12th episode of Raw, Lance turned on Murdoch, punching Murdoch in the face twice, ending the partnership. The two faced off on the June 2nd, 2008 edition of Raw, with Lance getting the victory to end their feud. By September of 2008, Lance moved on to storylines involving Chris Jericho and Shawn Michaels. His WWE career seemed to be on the rise as he was being booked in more high-profile matches. On the September 22nd episode of Raw, 
Lance would team up with Chris Jericho and Bradshaw, facing Batista and Shawn Michaels in a handicap match. Lance's team would win the match when he scored his clean pinfall on his former trainer and mentor Shawn Michaels. After the match, Lance left the arena abruptly without thanking Shawn, which violated rookie etiquette, as some would consider Shawn passing the torch to Lance, as Shawn pushed him very heavily to WWE management. On the September 29th edition of Raw, Lance and Chris Jericho would face Shawn Michaels and Triple H and would lose via disqualification. After the match when Lance returned backstage, he faced an angry Vince McMahon who was furious over Lance's performance and didn't think he was taking his push seriously enough. The next week, on October 6th in a no disqualification match with Michaels on Raw, Lance was beaten down with one brutal chair shot after another and left for dead in the middle of the ring and it turns out it was punishment. The punishment was for not having shown enough gratitude to Michaels who had gifted Lance with a pinfall win over him in the prior match. This took place nearly a year after Vince McMahon told CNN in a fall 2007 documentary that WWE was banning chair shots to the head. Her standpoint is just don't use chairs to the head. This would be Lance's last appearance on WWE television. The next two matches Lance had were house shows against D. Lo Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? as we go through the following safety instructions. On October 13th, 2008, during a commercial flight from San Bernardino, California to Puerto Rico for another WWE house show, Lance suffered a seizure on the plane during the journey. The airline attendants didn't recognize Lance and had no way of knowing what caused the seizure. Lillian Garcia, who was traveling on the same flight, told him his name and informed them that he was a professional wrestler and saw to it that he made it to the hospital. He was rushed to the hospital and still incoherent when he arrived. He underwent a series of tests because the medical staff wasn't sure whether the seizure was caused by an athletic injury as opposed to drug related. At the hospital they determined the seizure was caused by an overdose of pain medication. The feeling was that because the incident occurred in public and became a life and death situation, it warranted a punishment more severe than the standard wellness policy suspensions. Generally, WWE would suspend wrestlers who are found abusing prescription drugs for 30 to 60 days. However, considering the abuse in Cade's case resulted in a potentially life-threatening seizure, they decided to terminate his contract as they felt the situation was much more grave than any others they had dealt with in the past. The persisting heat apparently wasn't over the drug-induced seizure but Vince blowing up backstage a few weeks earlier at him for not taking his role seriously enough throughout the nervy performance during the Raw main event with DX. Sean took it personal when Lance stormed out of the building, forgetting to thank him for the tag match. And because of Sean's close relationship with McMahon's son-in-law Triple H, it didn't take long for word to reach the boss. In an October 2008 blog post, WWE commentator Jim Ross shed some light on Lance's sudden departure from the WWE. He would write, Lance Cade was abruptly released from his contract this week, much to the surprise of many of us. I've always thought that Lance had a wealth of physical potential, and he was always a polite young man in my dealings with him. Like many fans, I did my share of armchair quarterbacking as to why Lance was not featured in a more prominent role on WWE TV programming. However, it seemed that the past several weeks those issues were being addressed even to the point of Lance defeating HBK on a recent Monday Night Raw. The story I read on many internet sites about the reason for Lance's sudden dismissal is inaccurate. Many pundits speculate that Lance was dismissed because of a bad performance in a recent TV bout against DX on Raw, which is absolutely untrue. Lance's dismissal had zero to do with his in-ring performance or his lack of ability. Lance Cade was dismissed from WWE because, like many humans, he made a major league mistake while utilizing bad judgment that cost him his job. This included Lance having a seizure on an airplane and having to have emergency medical care. Luckily, Lillian Garcia was on the same flight and was instrumental in helping Lance get taken to the hospital, where a battery of tests were run that luckily determined that there was nothing seriously wrong with the young man such as a brain tumor. Everyone makes mistakes. Lord knows I have made plenty in my career, but in this day and time some mistakes simply just can't be condoned. To some fans, Lance Cade will still likely be perceived as a victim in this matter and his punishment too harsh. 
Under the circumstances of the situation, I don't know what other decision WWE could have made. I'm just relieved it wasn't me in my former role that would have had to address this matter. I really like this kid and hope that he continues to follow his dreams. Second chances are not foreign in the wrestling business, so perhaps that could be in Lance's future, but that's just a personal observation. Lance Cade is a talented young man whose best days should be ahead of him, and I wish him nothing but success. Lance has been knocked down and now it's time for him to get off the canvas and get back in the game. I'm damn sure pulling for him. Upon his WWE release, Lance dedicated spending more time with his family and would also reunite with his partner Trevor Murdoch, making appearances in the NWA as well as returning to Japan in December of that year, teaming with his former tag team partner Rene Dupree for Hustle on December 24th and 25th. They appeared as masked wrestlers Dinah and Might Sharp, a parody of the Sharp Brothers. But even though Lance was back in the ring full time, he was halfway across the world and thousands of miles away from his kids. This would be the first time not being home for Christmas. He chalked it up as being part of the business, but like all the injuries he was working through, he just numbed his feelings with more prescription drugs. Throughout the first half of 2009, he would spend most of his time in Japan, and in September he would face Rob Van Dam in a losing effort in Portugal for the WSW heavyweight title. In October, Lance would re-sign with the WWE and would be sent to Florida Championship Wrestling. But unfortunately, Lance's painkiller addiction had gotten worse over the previous year as he was splitting his time between the NWA and long tours to Japan. When John Laurinaitis told him in mid-December that they were finally ready to bring him up to the main roster from FCW, Lance, showing rigorous honesty, admitted to Laurinaitis that he was struggling through painkiller withdrawal on his own, which led to him being unable to sleep. This subsequently led Lance to becoming addicted to sleeping pills as well. So he asked to go to drug rehabilitation, which he successfully completed in February of 2010. Laurinaitis assured Lance he would have a spot for him on the roster when he completed treatment. Six weeks later, and after passing several drug tests for the WWE, he was released from his contract, with no explanation given. Shawn Michaels told him he was done as a WWE wrestler, I would never be used as a main eventer by the company. After being with the company for a decade and injuring himself over and over, proving he would do anything asked to him by Vince McMahon, he was wished well on his future endeavors. What got to me more was the notion that he had done the right thing in seeking out rehab to overcome his addiction, continued to pass drug tests, and yet been released by the WWE nevertheless. They tested him from the toe to the top of his head. He passed those tests, only to be released anyway. After he gets out of rehab, what is it now? He embarrassed you? Is that what it is? Don't tell me that you care about these people. Lance would have cut his arm off for Vince McMahon, but it wasn't there in return. He don't care any more than the man in the moon for them, other than his dollar signs. Lance wouldn't stay unemployed for long. Shortly after he would sign with All Japan Pro Wrestling and the next month again would be making grueling trips to Japan. Because of the difference in culture and the way addiction and recovery is viewed in Japan, it was impossible for Lance to stay off the pain medication and sleeping pills and began using even heavier than he did before rehab. Lance would comment during an interview with Kenny Bolin in May of 2010. Here I am the first active wrestler under contract with him that asked for help and ending up talking to Shawn Michaels six weeks after I did that, and him pretty much telling me I'm done, it's like, well, geez, you guys really do care about your talent, don't you? Here I made a pretty grown-up decision for all the positive things in my life, my family, myself, and of course my career, to benefit everybody, and they take that as a bad thing. His last match was in Japan on July 4th. Lance was eager to return to the States and see his family. During the second week of August, it was reported that family members believed there was something wrong with Lance, including his wife Tanya, who noticed he didn't look healthy and that he was having trouble breathing. Lance was rushed to the hospital on the evening of Tuesday, August the 10th, and was released the next day. His father Harley noticed that Lance showed up to his work on August the 12th, 
and was not looking good at all. After a series of unanswered phone calls, he went to Lance's home and discovered his son's lifeless body. According to the San Antonio Medical Examiner, Lance passed away from mixed intoxication, complicating a cardiomyopathy. When Dave Meltzer reported on Lance's death, he received a call from Vince McMahon because he originally thought Lance Storm had passed away. Around this time, Linda McMahon would be deep on the campaign trail in her attempt to gain a seat in the U.S. Senate. She didn't shy away from her past as CEO of the WWE, even highlighting her experience with the company and campaign ads. But the death of Lance and the lingering questions about the WWE's work practices threatened to turn the association into a negative one. During her run, Linda McMahon was known as a candidate who kicks men in the crotch and runs an operation where women are forced to bark like dogs. When asked about Lance's untimely passing, Linda McMahon said the company can no more be held accountable for his death than a studio that could have prevented Heath Ledger's death, referring to the actor who died of a drug overdose in 2008. Who knows what causes people to have addictions and do what they do, McMahon said. She would also go on to say she hardly knew Lance and might have met him once. Linda McMahon is a bold-faced liar. I've been with him on two different WWE functions where she came up to him and knew him by name. She disrespected him. She disrespected the whole family. During an interview with That's Wrestling, Trevor Murdoch would comment as he broke out in tears. It breaks my heart every day. I think an addiction took control of his life, and he fought that addiction, and he did everything he could. Trevor Murdoch admitted they frequently talked about the problem. According to a 2014 study by Eastern Michigan University examining professional wrestlers who were active between 1985 and 2011, mortality rates were almost three times greater. Experts suggest that a combination of the physical nature of the business, no off-season, and potentially high workload, with some fighting more than 200 matches per year, along with the drug culture in the business, contribute to the high mortality rates. The concept of untimely deaths of the professional wrestlers was a frequent topic of discussion on the Opie and Anthony show. Lance Cade was proficient in the ring, good on the mic, and as passionate about the wrestling business as he was about life itself. He represents the dark side of wrestling's big bright show, a side that few want to acknowledge, particularly not Vince and Linda McMahon. After a decade of dedication to the company, sacrificing his body, his health, and eventually his life. He has been forgotten by the WWE and never mentioned again publicly by the corporation. That was the story of Lance Cade. So I want all you people out there, I want you to get your brother, get your sister, get your daddy, get them all around the TV. Because you think now I witnessed something right here on TV today, baby. Terry Gordy was a professional wrestler from Chattanooga, Tennessee, who was born in 1961. A standout high school football and baseball player at Rossville High School, Terry dropped out at the age of 14 after getting into trouble with the law and being bailed out of jail by his uncle. He began his pro wrestling career initially for the International Wrestling Association and later would form the fabulous Freebirds with Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts who was added to the group. Along with the dozens of titles he won throughout his career, arguably one of the high points was becoming the very first Universal Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion and holding the belt for six months. During his career, he would make stops in Georgia Championship Wrestling, Memphis, Mid-South Wrestling, WCCW, All Japan Pro Wrestling, WWF, WCW, USWA, Global Wrestling Federation, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, 
ECW, International Wrestling Association in Japan, and war. During a flight to Japan in 1993 for one of his frequent All Japan tours, Terry allegedly took approximately 50 pain pills, resulting in an overdose on the flight that left him in a coma. It would be five days before he regained consciousness, unfortunately with permanent brain damage. At 6'4 and almost 300 pounds, Terry never had a problem handling himself either in or out of the ring, but this incident, along with years of drug abuse, heavy drinking and taking chair shots to the head, would prove to take a toll on his mental and physical health. Those close to him said he was never the same. He wrestled his last match returning to IWA Japan on February 4, 2001. He ultimately passed away later that same year at the age of 40, leaving behind a career spanning 27 years. He was inducted into the Southern Wrestling Hall of Fame, the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame Museum, and the WWE Hall of Fame as part of the fabulous Freebirds. This is the story of Terry Bam Bam Gordy. Terry Gordy was born on April 23, 1961 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He attended Rossville High School where he was a standout football and baseball player. He dropped out of high school following his freshman year. He was a big wrestling fan growing up watching NWA out of Tennessee run by Nick Goulas and Roy Welsh. Watching stars such as Jackie Fargo, Tojo Yamamoto, and the interns. He began wrestling in early 1974 at the age of 14 by lying about his age. Trained by Don Carson and the Mongolian stomper Archie Goldie in Knoxville. He started out in Lakeview, Georgia as one of the mass scavengers. Throughout 1974 and most of 1975, he would wrestle mostly tag team matches under a mask worried that someone might recognize him and jeopardize his career because he was technically still a minor. One of his first televised matches was against veteran Big Cat Ernie Ladd sometime in 1975, known as Terry Mecca. He would also form a tag team with Gino Brito, facing teams such as the Mongols. In mid-1976, he returned to his hometown of Chattanooga, working for Lou Thez, and again would perform under a mask, this time as Mr. Wrestling 3, but would also use the name Terry Meeker, occasionally teaming with his kayfabe brother, Jerry Meeker. In June of 1977, he would then travel to Nova Scotia, where he would feud with David Schultz, but before the end of the summer, he would return to Memphis and would continue his series of matches with Dr. D and would also tag a handful of times with the young Robert Gibson and Norvell Austin. According to Terry, he didn't last long because of his lack of interview skills, but before the year was up, he would relocate to Mississippi working for the great Mephisto in his international championship wrestling promotion, making $40 a night working six days a week. On January 14th of 1978 in Greenwood, Mississippi, he beat Bill Ash to win the vacant ICW Mississippi title in the tournament final. In February of that year, he met Michael Hayes, who is known as Lord Michael Hayes. Even though he thought Hayes was arrogant and cocky, they became partners. They would wrestle their first match as a tag team on February 16th against the Mongols, which would be the start of their lifelong friendship. When Terry was given a $10 raise per night and Michael wasn't, they both left in December of that year. Terry, still Mississippi heavyweight champion, went back to Memphis to work for Welsh and Goulas. Michael Hayes would now be known as Pretty Boy Michael Hayes and they officially became the Fabulous Freebirds and after a short time became NWA Mid-America Champions, feuding with the Mexican Angel, Dutch Mantel, as well as Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee, selling out the Mid-South Coliseum regularly. The Freebirds became extremely popular and at the time were the only wrestlers using ring entrance music. Initially Terry thought the music had no place in wrestling, but Hayes talked him into it. They would then head to Louisiana, where Bill Watts was running shows. They would spend half of 1980 feuding with Buck Robley and the Junkyard Dog. One of the most popular angles was when Michael Hayes blinded Junkyard Dog with the Freebird hair cream. 
Bill Watts over the years would fire Terry several times for being late and drinking too much. Bill Watts thought Michael was a better talker than wrestler, so he teamed Terry with Buddy Roberts and Michael would manage the duo. By the end of 1980, they ended up in Georgia as they were looking for international exposure and the territory was being shown on TBS, alongside stars such as Austin Idol, Tommy Rich and Dusty Rhodes. According to Terry, Ole Anderson came up with the Freebird rule, which allowed any two members of the three-man team to wrestle in the match, as Michael was sick of just doing all the talking and wanted to take part in the match. Throughout the first half of 1981, the Birds had some of the biggest feuds and the most legendary matches in the history of GCW. In one of the famous matches shown on WTBS, now known as the Pile Driver match, Terry Gordy gave Ted DiBiase four consecutive pile drivers, which led DiBiase being taken away in an ambulance. During their time in Georgia in early 1982, Terry would form a team with Jimmy Snuka and turn on Michael and they briefly feuded. With Hayes as a hero and Gordy as a villain, Hayes and Gordy eventually patched up their differences and reformed the Freebirds as a duo in the Dothan Farm Center. They feuded with Ole Anderson and Stan Hansen over the NWA World Tag Team titles throughout the summer of 1982. After a brief stint in Pensacola in the Gulf Coast Territory and returning to Georgia for a few months, in October of 1982, they would make their way to World Class Championship Wrestling in Texas where they began their legendary feud with the Von Erichs. According to Terry, David Von Erich was the best worker out of all the brothers. In November, Michael Hayes and Terry Gordy beat Bill Irwin and King Kong Bundy to win the NWA World Class Tag Team titles. In early 1984, the Freebirds made their debut in Japan, where Terry would travel to frequently, working for All Japan Pro Wrestling. Been saving every penny for to make up through the fall. Working for that dollar, but it never adds up at all. The Freebirds spent a brief time in the World Wrestling Federation in late 1984 with several matches against the Moondogs, but were fired after missing a show and showing up late and drunk, and according to rumors were kicked out of the locker room by Andre the Giant. During the Freebirds' extremely brief WWF run, they had David Wolf as their manager, who was the real-life manager of Cindy Lauper. Individually, the Freebirds had all their strengths and weaknesses, but together as one unit, they were nearly flawless. Although they were a headache at times to the various promoters they worked for, their bad boy image wasn't really an image at all, as they wrestled hard and partied just as hard. Promoters would often overlook their transgressions outside the ring because they filled arenas and made lots of money wherever they went. Gordy, Roberts, and Hayes were heat magnets, and whether it was feuding with the Von Erichs or winning the titles in Georgia or Mid-South territories, the fabulous Freebirds were all about success. Coming around the river banker, the old train was so sane. The very next thing you hear from me, I've been tied to a ball and chain. In 1985, Terry was banned from flying on Northwest Orient Airlines ever again. The lifetime ban was due to his behavior on at least one flight to Japan, where Gordy was intoxicated and was harassing several other passengers, including the airline staff. Because traveling to Japan was vital to Terry's livelihood, the Freebird needed to get himself back on the airline. Terry decided to use another person's name to book a flight. The name he used was a fellow wrestler, Kurt Hennig. When the airline discovered that Kurt Hennig was really Terry Gordy, both were blacklisted from flying with them. It is unknown if Hennig was ever aware that Gordy used his name to book the flight. It is also unknown if he was ever reinstated on Northwest Orient Airlines. The Freebirds would leave Texas and work for Vern Gagne in the AWA for a short time before leaving when Bill Watts started up the UWF. Terry started his feud with Steve Williams and began wrestling more as a singles wrestler and in 1986 became the first UWF champion, which he would hold for six months before forfeiting the title to the one-man gang. In 1986, the Angel of Death became the bodyguard to the Freebirds. He would soon turn on the Freebirds and join Skandar Akbar's Devastation Incorporated, turning the Freebirds into babyfaces. According to the Observer around this time, Terry Gordy blew out his knee so bad that he needed surgery. But when the doctor told him he would be out of action for six months to a year, 
He informed the doctor that all of a sudden his leg wasn't hurting as bad. They would then bounce between WCCW and Georgia Championship Wrestling. In late 1987, Iceman Parsons joined Terry Gordy and Buddy Roberts after Michael Hayes left the Freebirds to help them get revenge on him. Parsons was now known as the Blackbird. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin would also team with the Freebirds and WCCW and other territories. In 1989, the Freebirds would make their way to WCW in full force and this time officially add Jimmy Garvin to the mix. Together, Garvin and Hayes won the WCW World Tag Team titles, the United States Tag Team titles and the WCW World Six Man titles. Jimmy, being a pilot, talked Terry into training to become a pilot as well until a rough landing during a training session ended with Terry clipping a gas truck with the wing of the plane. The Freebirds concept was heavily derived from the Leonard Skinner song Freebird and the image of Southern Pride evoked by the band. For most of the team's early existence, the song was used as their entrance music in both television and live appearances. On occasion, they would also enter the ring to Willie Nelson's rendition of Georgia On My Mind. The Freebirds are sometimes credited as the first wrestlers to use entrance music, although others including Gorgeous George, use of Pomp and Circumstance, and Big Daddy's use of We Shall Not Be Moved, and Chris Colt's use of Welcome to My Nightmare by Alice Cooper all predate the Freebirds. During the mid-1980s, a number of North American wrestling promotions who licensed copywritten music faced difficulties in continuing those licenses. Other promotions which did not license music were under scrutiny for the practice. Promotions began looking for solutions. The WWF, which hired Jimmy Hart and Jim Johnson in 1985, used their talents to write and produce music under which the copyrights could be controlled by the company. Around the same time, Michael Hayes recorded the song Bad Street USA and released a music video, which included other Freebird members. The song would be used as entrance music for the Freebirds from that point forward, though they would use other songs on occasion. During 1990, Terry would feud with Lex Luger and would run into 1991, but didn't think Lex was a good wrestler. Diamond Dallas Page came to World Championship Wrestling in 1991 as a manager of the fabulous Freebirds, Jimmy Garvin and Michael Hayes. Page managed the Freebirds to a shot to the NWA World Tag Team Championship, where they defeated Doom, Butch Reed and Ron Simmons. Before the match took place, Page unveiled the stable's new road manager, Big Daddy Dink, formerly known as Oliver Humperdink. In keeping with the Freebirds rock and roll band gimmick, he was referred to as their tour manager slash road boss. By this time, Terry was spending most of his time in Japan. At the Clash of Champions, he would face Dr. Death Steve Williams, who he would also form a tag team with while in Japan, and later in 1992, the two would feud with the Steiners and WCW. Come this time tomorrow Reckon I don't know where I'll be But if it wasn't for that old sheriff I'd be back in Tennessee During a flight to Japan in August of 1993 for one of his frequent All Japan tours Terry would allegedly take roughly 50 pain pills resulting in an overdose on the flight that left him in a coma It would be five days before Terry emerged from the coma unfortunately with permanent brain damage whether or not this damage could have been avoided had the incident not happened on a flight across the world is nothing but speculation. But one thing for certain is that the once imposing muscle of the fabulous Freebirds would now be a shell of his former self. Friends in the business would go on to note that the previously happy Terry Gordy was now more calm, almost in a constant state of confusion, which ended his relationship with All Japan Pro Wrestling. During a shoot interview with RF Video, Terry apologized to his fans for the incident. During 1994, he would only wrestle a handful of matches for the Global Wrestling Federation. In February 1995, Terry made his first appearance as the Executioner, teaming with Mike Bell losing to the Smoking Guns. He would be sent to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, teaming with Tommy Rich as a militia. He would feud with Brad Armstrong and even won the Smoky Mountain Heavyweight Championship, defeating Armstrong. A month later, he dropped the title back to Armstrong in a country whipping match. Terry left SMW before it closed its doors at the end of the year. 
During 1995, he would also return to Japan, now working for IWA, and had several matches with Cactus Jack. In 1996, Gordy appeared in Extreme Championship Wrestling to challenge Raven for the ECW World Heavyweight title as an internationally recognized number one contender. He also wrestled Bam Bam Bigelow at Ultimate Jeopardy in what was billed as the Battle of the Bam Bams. Terry lost the match due to the outside interference from the Eliminators. He was then called back up to the WWF. In 1996, he teamed with Mankind, both managed by Paul Bearer and feuded with The Undertaker. The Executioner came to the ring under a mask and carrying an axe as Paul Bearer's hired assassin. His finishing move was a deadly Asiatic spike. He made his TV debut at the In Your House pay-per-view Buried Alive when he interfered in The Undertaker's Buried Alive match with Mankind, hitting The Undertaker with a shovel and burying him with the help of Mankind and several other wrestlers. However, at In Your House 12 It's Time, The Undertaker defeated The Executioner in an Armageddon rules match. Dave Meltzer gave the match two and a half stars. For anyone that knew Terry, it was kind of sad and tough to watch as Terry was considered a wrestling prodigy, but at this point he was just a shell of his former self. Undertaker, growing up in Texas and a Freebirds fan, wanted so much to try and help Terry, but the plane incident in 1993 was still greatly affecting him. According to Bruce Pritchard, it was a sad scene and hard to watch. Terry left the promotion shortly afterwards. His final televised appearance was on January 12, 1997 on WWF Superstars when he lost to Goldust, after which Paul Bearer turned on him by hitting him with his urn. He was advertised to be one of the 30 participants in the 1997 Royal Rumble match, but did not make his appearance. He returned to WWF one last time in a house show as The Executioner on April 28, 1998, losing to Wellington Wilkins. According to several sources, Terry was brought in as a favor to Michael Hayes who was working backstage, but he wasn't the same in the ring and to protect his legacy, they hid his identity in case things didn't work out. Had Gordy been able to compete at a high level, there would have been the opportunity to later unmask. Terry returned to Japan, working for International Wrestling Association of Japan, where he wrestled in death matches, mainly working in tag teams. He left IWA Japan in 1997. In 1998, he returned to Japan for the final time working for Wrestle Association R. After leaving the WWF in Japan, Terry worked in the independent circuit. On February 21, 1998, he teamed with Dan Severn in a losing effort to Doug Gilbert and Dutch Mantel at the Eddie Gilbert Memorial Show for IWA Mid-South. Terry would reunite with Hayes as they fought Glenn Kulka and J.R. Smooth to a no contest for Power Pro Wrestling on May 28, 1999. He wrestled his last match returning to IWA Japan in February of 2001. Terry died of a heart attack caused by a blood clot on July 16, 2001. In 2014, he was inducted into the Southern Wrestling Hall of Fame. A year later, he was also inducted into the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame and Museum. And on April 2, 2016, he was inducted by his son into the WWE Hall of Fame as part of the Fabulous Freebirds. According to Jim Ross on his Grilling JR podcast, Terry's drug issues were one of the main reasons he didn't have a big singles run during the 1990s. Jim Ross would state, There was nothing he couldn't do in the ring. Terry was extraordinary. When he was 15 or 16, he was already the size of a grown man and already well beyond his experience level. He was a natural. Anything to do with wrestling, he would have been a success. Terry Gordy would have been a huge success because he was that athletic big man that promoters loved. Big athletes that turned heads in airports. His personality was bigger than life. Not denigrating Buddy or Michael Hayes, but the Freebird three-man team, Terry was the star of the show. He was as good as super heavyweight or 300-pound guys I ever saw. He was extraordinary. Nikita Koloff recalled his first and only trip to Japan. He said he was at a bar after the matches with Terry and claimed that Terry became a different person when he became drunk. He would get rowdy, then angry, then uncontrollable. On this occasion, Terry started by throwing drink glasses at the wall. 
After that, he took a fire extinguisher and started spraying the contents throughout the bar. He then threw the extinguisher out the window. Realizing that the police were called, I dragged him out of the bar and back to the hotel. Terry Gordy was a big star in Japan, and it was Nikita who took the brunt of the heat from the Japanese officials after they were notified about the incident. Nikita claimed he was never asked back to do another tour after that. Michael Hayes would record a song called Freebird Road, a heartfelt tribute to his best friend, and film part of the video at the grave of Terry Gordy. The reaction to Hayes' tribute was overwhelmingly positive. Many WWE superstars view the song as a fitting honor for the legendary grappler, and many who competed with and against Terry were also touched by the song. Most importantly to Hayes was the reaction from the Gordy family. With Michael Hayes as the mouthpiece, Buddy Roberts as the technician, and Terry Gordy the muscle who could do it all in the ring, and among many wrestling fans, top 10 list of greatest in-ring performers. Even in Japan where they rarely paid tribute to American wrestlers who passed away, Terry was given a 10 bell salute. That was the story of Terry Bam Bam Gordy. Buy yourself a postcard so you can see the lights of town. Find yourself a country girl, keep quiet and settle. Professional wrestling is a world of accounts of stories of over-the-top victories of athletes combating adversities and winning titles. It also has its share of shocking tragedies such as the Von Erichs, Owen Hart, Mike Awesome, and the Grams. You've probably heard the saying, there are always three sides to every story, and somewhere in the middle lies the truth. When it comes to the tragedies of Eddie and Mike Graham, it's anyone's guess what really happened. The wrestling business is filled with individuals who are gone that can no longer defend themselves from analysis and allegations, and the ones that are still around frequently exploit this by trying to put themselves over while they can. A father and son who lived their lives during completely different generations, but yet had countless similarities. On January 21, 1985, it was reported Eddie Graham had taken his own life. His grandson Stephen took his own life on December 14, 2010, and Mike Graham committed suicide in a similar manner on October 19, 2012. This is a story of the various theories surrounding the deaths of Eddie and his son Mike Graham. Eddie Graham, whose real name Edward Gossett, and who early in his career in Texas wrestled under the name Rip Rogers, became known in the Northeast in the late 1950s as part of a top-rated tag team with his brother, Dr. Jerry Graham, known as the Golden Grahams or the Graham Brothers. They found huge success in Boston, New York and Washington DC, and other territories of capital wrestling, which was a precursor to the WWF. Dr. Jerry Graham was Vincent K. McMahon's favorite wrestler. As a teenager in the late 1950s, McMahon would dye his hair blonde to emulate Graham and even dress like him. The very prestigious US tag team titles became theirs on several occasions until 1960 when Eddie left for Florida. Jerry Graham, wielding a hunting knife and a sawed off shotgun, would later attempt to steal his mother's dead body from the hospital shortly after she passed away. Other members of this kayfabe family included Crazy Luke and later superstar Billy Graham. When Eddie was in the New York area, he became one of the most popular and wealthiest wrestlers of that era. The Graham brothers, Dr. Jerry and Eddie Graham, tried to stave off Antonio Roca and Miguel Perez during wrestling's golden era. Anytime anyone ever talked about wrestling, Bill Apter once said, Eddie Graham's name always came up. If you came to New York and talked about wrestling in the 1950s or 60s, the Graham brothers were the first names they mentioned. Eddie's further success in tag team wrestling was obtained in Florida with partners Sam Steamboat, Bob Orton Sr. and Big Ike Eakins. 
Eddie also became a two-time Southern Heavyweight Champion for the NWA in 1962 and 63. In 1968, Eddie Graham, who was already blind in one eye since birth, just barely escaped death in a locker room when a 75-pound steel window fell on his head at Tampa's Fort Hesterly Armory causing both his retinas to be torn. Other sources claim they had become detached. The injury required him to get 300 stitches on his face and head. He was ultimately awarded $23,000 by the Florida State Legislature for the damages caused and was out of action for 15 months. In the early 1970s, he became a majority owner and bought into the Florida Territory, formerly owned by his trainer, Cowboy Bob Luttrell. There he took charge of championship wrestling from Florida's promoting and booking. He did bring in others to help him with booking from time to time, but Eddie always had the final say. Eddie Graham developed professional and amateur wrestling in the Sunshine State like nobody before and nobody since by generously donating vast sums of money for amateur wrestling camps, youth organizations, and various scholarships for universities in the Tampa, Florida area. Eddie saw how important little things could change the lives of youngsters in the community from a very young age. As a young kid growing up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, he would sell newspapers and the newspaper in turn gave them all free memberships to the YMCA as a gift. Without that help, he would never have been able to afford it. This is also how he began lifting weights and was exposed to wrestling, where at 14 he met Latrell, who was a hated heel until later getting into promoting in the Florida Territory. His first match was at age 17, and Eddie got paid with no money but a turkey. His father was not supportive of his wrestling because he didn't believe there was any money in it, but his mother backed him wholeheartedly. With his wrestling career winding down, he teamed with his son Mike, and together they won the Florida and Georgia versions of the tag team titles, while he himself stayed active until 1980. The father and son team of Eddie and Mike Graham battled Dick Slater and Pac Song in 1974. Eddie Graham's colleagues demonstrated how much they respected his mind for the business by electing him president of the NWA from 1976 to 78. With the territories thriving during his tenure, he was also instrumental in the historic unification title bouts between WWWF world champion superstar Billy Graham and NWA world champion Harley Race. At the time, the event held at the Orange Bowl in Miami was called the Super Bowl of Wrestling. And after a 60-minute bout, it ended in a controversial draw in front of a reported 12,000 fans under stormy conditions. With Gorilla Monsoon and Don Curtis as referees, the third fall began with the bout tied at one fall apiece. Superstar Billy Graham, with his shoulders pinned on the mat and clearly not responding due to Race's sleeper hold, was literally saved by the bell after Curtis counted to only one before the time limit expired. Once his in-ring career was over, Eddie Graham focused on his charitable organizations, real estate deals, and the Florida Territory's continual promotion. In terms of population, the whole state was going through a growth spurt. This is when, according to his son Mike, his father saw the writing on the wall that spelled doom for the territory and the business he had loved. The 1980s is when the continuous squabbling and backstabbing amongst the power-hungry owners of the different NWA territories finally caught up with them. A young upstart by the name of Vincent K. McMahon in 1982 acquired Capital Wrestling from his father and split from the NWA. He decided to take his product national while disregarding the regional agreements held by the NWA owners since 1948. With the various territories collapsing and closing operations, one of the final strongholds of the weakened NWA became the Carolinas under Jim Crockett Promotions, led by Jim Crockett Jr or Jimmy as he was referred to by Mike Graham. He also had a vision of a national product, but at the expense of using surviving territories like Florida as an unofficial farm system, where he would lure Dusty Rhodes, Barry Windham, Lex Luger and Ron Bass to his promotion in Charlotte. By now he was referring and promoting it as the NWA as if his partners didn't exist. Magnum TA was also a key star that left Florida, but had a brief but memorable stint in Bill Watts Mid-South before heading to Charlotte. According to Mike Graham in a kayfabe commentary shoot interview, Dusty Rhodes leaving Florida may have been the territory's death blow. Meanwhile, the WWF continued to purge the NWA and AWA of its stars to stem the tide in its favor further. On July 14, 1984, to the horror of many fans, 
and what would later be called as Black Saturday, the WWF took over the time slot on Superstation WTBS that once belonged to Georgia Championship Wrestling. By all accounts, Georgia was easily one of the top territories of the NWA. A now megastar named Hulk Hogan began to run wild in arenas and televised screens across the country. This made for TV Muscle Man, who urged the chants of fans while ripping his t-shirt off to the theme of Eye of the Tiger, seemingly threatened the other wrestling companies with his leg drop finisher as if to put an end to their futile attempts of recovering their once dominant territories. The WWF was moving at breakneck speed and permanently sprinting ahead of the wrestling race as if it were a race between a tortoise and a hare. With no respect for the old guard, Vince McMahon was destined to end the territory system. During all of this, Eddie Graham took his own life at the age of 55 on January 21st, 1985 with a self-inflicted gunshot to the temple using a large caliber revolver. In a shoot interview conducted by Kayfabe Memories, his son Mike believed that various factors including financial, personal troubles with his girlfriend, and his long struggle with alcohol may have led his father to taking his own life. After his father's passing and the circumstances wrestling was in, it would have been almost impossible for anyone to keep the CWF afloat. Mike wound up selling his interest to Jim Crockett Jr. in 1987 and later got hired as a trainer and a booker for WCW. Bill Apter, who met Graham in 1971, says that Graham killed himself in a period of change that I don't think he would have been happy to live through. I think he would believe there's too much of the showbiz entertainment. Eddie always sold wrestling. In wrestling business terms, Mike's father perhaps saw the writing on the wall and foresaw the continued crumbling and eventual sinking of the NWA at the hands of the future juggernaut of wrestling, the WWF. Now a global corporation that goes by the name of World Wrestling Entertainment, this monster of sports entertainment had over $975 million in revenues in 2020, with the vast majority coming from its media library. Terry Funk recalls Eddie not having a lot of formal education, but became a self-made individual who learned to fly planes and captain boats. Graham saw Dory Funk and Amarillo become heavily involved in the community and in turn many opportunities and business opened for him. Graham tried to replicate this in Florida and became a very successful business owner and respected community entrepreneur. In his book, Terry Funk, More Than Just Hardcore, he further states, Eddie had a great mind for the business and a great feel for the fans. He had a great mind for the manipulation and continuation of what you would call storylines today. He was very ahead of his time in terms of how he promoted. When someone becomes very powerful and influential, they always have defenders and detractors. Former NWA world champion, rugged Ronnie Garvin, agreed that Eddie had an excellent business mind. However, in a shoot interview with Hannibal TV, he stated Eddie Graham as a human being was a piece of sh He'd pilot his plane while drunk. Garvin would speculate about Eddie's suicide and mention that he had a girlfriend at the time, even though he was married. Five or six years after Eddie's death, his son Mike showed Garvin a check for $600,000 after selling land for the Florida Sheriff Boys Ranch his father had owned. Ronnie further stated, even with all that money, Mike still wasn't happy. The assassin Jody Hamilton remembers a time when Eddie Graham didn't do so well in business and troubles were starting to brew. He recounts from his book Assassin, shortly after I took over the book in Florida, Eddie Graham and Buddy Fuller went to Australia and took their girlfriends with them. They had just bought the promotion in Australia from Jim Barnett and were convinced they would take the country by storm. Eddie told us, we're going to quadruple the business that Barnett did. Of course, history shows that they failed and lost their entire investment. Hamilton further states, there's a lot of bickering going on in the office between the partners. While I was trying to conduct business, the partners would all be in Eddie's office, hollering, screaming, yelling and arguing. When times were good, the business was booming, there was no problems. But when business slowed down, Eddie would go to them and say, the partners all need to cough up some money and get us through this slump. You have to come up with a specific amount of money which is based on your percentage of the towns you own. Jody Hamilton also admits that Eddie made huge contributions to Florida, amateur wrestling and the youth. Still, even though he was knowledgeable and had great ideas, the alcohol could often cloud his judgment. In a shoot interview with Hannibal TV, Kevin Sullivan admitted he got caught up with the wrong people 
With so many stories on Eddie's death, there is a little truth in all of them. Sullivan agrees with Jody that Eddie had a brilliant mind for the business, but alcoholism was one of his demons that sometimes led him to make bad decisions. He claims that Eddie had been sober for 13 years but fell off the wagon while on a fishing trip with himself and his son Mike. He further states that Eddie believed he was smart and never thought he could be conned. Eddie supposedly knew a person in the political scene who was also part of the planning department. Rumors are that he invested a lot of money based on illegal inside information from this person. Once fired, there was a fear that he'd be exposed. It would have been an embarrassing situation for him in the community. Add to this the problems of him having a girlfriend while he was married. This theory about the real estate deal gone wrong is one that superstar Billy Graham also believes had something to do with Eddie's suicide. Eddie had worked his whole life to portray a decent image of a respected person in the community. This alleged fraud would have been the end of him and would face probable jail time if convicted, according to superstar Billy Graham. Kevin Sullivan further speculates that maybe Eddie had health issues because his body had changed. He doesn't toss out the possibility that alcohol had something to do with it. Dutch Mantell, who was hired to book Florida in 1984, recalls Eddie always tense and troubled. He remembered not being able to talk to Eddie to pick his brain because he was always on the phone with someone at the office. He too believed the rumor of the real estate with a shady background to it, as one of the main catalysts of Eddie deciding to take his own life. Along with the business being down in Florida, with all the talent that had gone to the Carolinas. California-based psychiatrist Dr. David Reese, CEO of Beyond Wellness Talent Protection, comments, Theoretically, many factors may have contributed to Eddie's suicide, including chronic depression, alcoholism, long-term effects of the acute head injury, as well as possible chronic pain or additional effects of minor head injuries related to Eddie's wrestling career. We can only speculate how these factors affected Eddie's behavior and relationship with Mike, but there had to have been a significant impact. Graham made contributions to a number of charitable causes as chief of the Florida Boys and Girls Ranch Villa. In 1957, Graham, Cowboy Latrell, and Hillsboro Sheriff Ed Blackburn began efforts to establish the organization. Graham donated funds from every championship wrestling from Florida show to the villa, bringing in a reported $100,000, also donating to a high school and college level amateur wrestling events. On January 21, 1985, after a night of heavy drinking mixed with prescription pills, was sitting on his bed sipping coffee. It was late morning, a few days after his 55th birthday, and he had not slept well. He looked terrible. For a month or more, the usually vivacious Eddie Graham had been withdrawn. He wasn't going into the office every day and would hardly say a word during dinner. On his 50th birthday, he had been celebrated in a big benefit attended by Tampa politicians and business leaders. This year, for his 55th, he stayed home. He didn't even want to go around the corner to visit his grandchildren who adored him. Lucy Gossett knew something was bugging her husband, but she wasn't sure what. In the last few months, she said, he was always deep in thought, very quiet, wouldn't talk. I'm sure the grandchildren noticed it too. That morning, I had just gotten up I asked Eddie if he wanted to go to Biscuits to get some chicken, and he said no. He asked me if I'd made coffee, and I said yes. And so I went on, and I didn't even stay there, I just came back home. And he was just real nervous. He was white, just white. And he was sitting beside the bed drinking his coffee, and he never did that. He always went into the family room, drank his coffee, and read the paper. Then the phone rang. It was a friend with some extra vegetables from her garden. I went back into the bedroom, and I said, Eddie, I'll be right back. And he says, okay. He says, you can fix me some breakfast when you get back. She was gone just 15 minutes. It was that quick, she says. While his wife was out, Eddie went into another room where he kept a cabinet stocked with several rifles and handguns. He removed a five-shot, 38 caliber, blue steel Smith & Wesson revolver, inserted one bullet, returned to the bedroom and lay face up on the bed dressed only in his underwear. He put the gun to his right temple and pulled the trigger. When I opened the door, I heard this gurgling. I went in there and he was on the bed. He had shot himself, says his wife. He was still breathing. An ambulance rushed him to St. Joseph's Hospital in Tampa, where he died a few hours later. Afterwards, when Mike went through his father's papers, he would find notes that Eddie had written to himself during those weeks and months of brooding. Only then did his family begin to realize what he had been going through. Mike won't share the notes, but he says it may hold a clue to why his father ended his own life. I've been conned, one note read. 
and the embarrassment is too much to stand. By any measure, Eddie Graham was a success. He was born poor, had worked hard, reached the top of his field, achieved fame and wealth and respect. His marriage lasted 35 years, surviving lean years and life on the road. He had a son who followed in his footsteps and who gave him two fine grandchildren. In some ways though, he was two people. One the fan saw, tough, brutal, mean. The other his friend saw, tough, yet but soft inside, a gentle, kind man who loved practical jokes. Graham's participation in a land deal gone wrong led him to needing to raise over $500,000, including financial and marriage problems contributed to his death. I'm aware of the bonds that were created today. On October 18, 2012, at the age of 61, Mike Graham, whose real name was Edward Michael Gossett, committed suicide just like his father by way of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head in Daytona Beach, Florida while attending an annual event for motorcycle enthusiasts called Biketoberfest. Mike's son Stephen Edward Gossett at the age of 37 also took his own life the same way at the same event two years earlier in 2010. Kevin Sullivan claims after all these deaths, he found out that Eddie's father, Mike's grandfather, also committed suicide and Eddie had a brother with terminal cancer who also took his own life. Sullivan remembers Mike saying once to him, Jerry Briscoe and a couple of other friends after both his father and late son had passed away, I must have been a horrible son and a horrible father. Sullivan continued, Mike went downhill after his son died and wasted away to nothing. Sullivan also recalls a chilling phone call after Mike's final ever guest on his radio show, Talking Wrestling with Mike Graham. Afterward, he was strangely emotional and told Kevin that he loved him, Six days later, Mike killed himself. According to the Post and Courier with Mike Mooneyham, in a haunting similar phone call from Eddie Graham to his son before killing himself after Super Bowl Sunday in 1985, he also called his son Mike to remind him that he loved him. Although it can be said that Mike Graham had success in pro wrestling compared to so many others that have laced up the boots and entered the squared circle, he never became a major star and certainly didn't reach the heights that his father Eddie did. Mike entered the sport against his mother Lucy's wishes as she did not want Mike's wife to go through what she did during Eddie Graham's career in which many times he had been injured or come home bloodied. She was also aware of the dismaying task Mike would have trying to live up to the Graham family name his father had established. In the long run, it seems like his short statue also became a huge obstacle in getting the big push he needed in wrestling. So much that Dusty Rhodes in a shoot interview with Stone Cold Steve Austin says that he became Eddie's wrestling son because certain limitations Mike had such as his height. The 16-time world champion nature boy Ric Flair is quick to defend his former friend. Mike Graham was tough as they come, a phenomenal performer who never got the recognition he deserved because he was considered too small to be a championship contender. His reputation was legit for his size and he was very tough. Famed play-by-play -play announcer Gordon Soley respected Mike's gutsiness and fortitude in the ring, and he stated he'd go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a buzzsaw and give it the first two rounds. Before wrestling professionally, Mike was a three-time state AAU collegiate wrestling champion and a state champion at the 154-pound weight class. As a sophomore, he defeated a senior named Richard Blood, who later became Ricky Steamboat. Mike was also an accomplished powerlifter who set state records in the bench press. Former NWA world champ Dory Funk recalls young Mike Graham would take on all comers to see if they had the skill and credibility to become a pro wrestler. Mike did this along with Japanese shooter Hiro Mitsuda, Bob Roop, the Briscoe brothers Jack and Jerry at the infamous Snake Pit Gym located at the Tampa Sportatorium. At the time of Mike's death, he was wearing his son's old work boots. In Mike's case, comments Dr. Reese, it appears that the most compelling factor was the suicide of his son in 2010. In the incident report, his wife comments that after the suicide of their son, Mike threatened to commit suicide on several occasions. Studies also show that parents' behavioral traits can pass to their children as a predisposition towards alcohol and addiction. In a kayfabe commentary shoot interview with Jim Cornette, Kevin Sullivan stated that Eddie told him that he got divorced in Amarillo, Texas from his wife Lacey when Mike was around two or three years old, but because he loved his boy so much, he stuck with her. He says that after a couple years Eddie died, Mike found out and confronted Sullivan on why he didn't tell me he had known. Now things started to fall in place for Mike. He realized that maybe he was too hard on his father. There were times when he didn't get along with him, but Eddie usually got along fine with Kevin. Bill Watts offered, 
The suicide was more understandable with Eddie because of the things that he was doing, but with Mike, you never saw it coming. On a biochemical basis, says Dr. Reese, recent studies have found that stress of any childhood trauma causes chemical changes in the brain that are associated with a risk of depression and suicide. Though their high standards in the ring, Eddie and Mike Graham should be remembered for their positive contributions to wrestling. They left the sport better than they had entered it. More importantly though, Eddie Graham left behind a better world through his civic work and helped shape many youths that now as adults surely appreciate all he did. But sadly, the tragic way their lives ended will be discussed for generations to come by fans and non-followers of the grappling game alike. Eddie Graham was inducted into the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame in 1996 and inducted posthumously into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2008 by Dusty Rhodes with his son Mike Graham accepting the offer on his father's behalf. Mike Graham was a 16-time NWA Florida Tag Team Champion with various partners. He was awarded the Pro Wrestling Illustrated Rookie of the Year Award in 1972. He was also ranked number 100 in the PWI 500 for 1992. That was the story of Eddie and Mike Graham. I'm aware of the bonds that were created today When you told me that sure there's a way The water's so still and my pain has gone away The air is much cleaner after it rain Michael Alfonso also known as Captain Awesome, The Gladiator, The Pro, The Career Killer, Fat Chick Thriller, That 70s Guy, and most famously Mike Awesome, was a professional wrestler who broke into the business in the late 1980s when him and his cousin Horace Hogan, who is also the nephew of Hulk Hogan, decided they both wanted to become professional wrestlers. His first match was in 1989 in Florida, but would spend a majority of his early career wrestling in Japan as a gladiator, and eventually ECW, WCW, and the WWF. At 6'6 six six and almost 300 pounds, he would dive over the top rope like a cruiserweight onto his opponents onto the floor. Incredibly agile for a man his size, he was known for putting on some of the hardest hitting, mind blowing matches a wrestling fan could ever see. His matches with Masato Tanaka in both ECW and Japanese promotion Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling are legendary. He would go on to win titles in FMW, ECW, and WWF. Along with his longtime feud with Masato Tanaka, one of his most well-known matches was when he began his tenure with the WCW and was still ECW champion wrestling Taz who was employed by the WWF. Mike retired from professional wrestling in 2005 and became a real estate agent. Sadly, his life tragically ended and prematurely in 2007 at the age of 42. Many fans would agree Mike Awesome was among the most underused and underappreciated wrestlers who ever stepped into the ring. This is the story of Michael Alfonso, a.k.a. Mike Awesome. Mike was born in Tampa, Florida on January 24, 1965. Some of his first exposure to wrestling was at the age of 10, attending the matches at the Fort Homer Hesterly Armory in Tampa with other kids from the neighborhood, watching stars such as Dusty Rhodes and Jack Briscoe. He attended King High School in Tampa, Florida, and after graduating he worked in construction for a year and decided to study accounting at Hillsboro Community College, but had dreams of becoming a professional wrestler. He trained at Stan's gym on 56th Street. After working out hard for a year and telling anyone that would listen his goals of becoming a wrestler, one of his friends from the gym wrote down Steve Kern's number after seeing an ad on TV for his wrestling school. Mike made the call and went down and signed up, dropping out of college after three years. Although his parents were disappointed, he dropped out of school, they were supportive of his dream. In January of 1988, he paid his $2,000 fee and began training at Steve Kern's school along with Dennis Knight, also known as Midian and would be the only two who would complete the training. He would also train with Al Green, who joined the class later on. Aside from learning how to take bumps, he would learn a lot of ring psychology from Lou Perez, who also smartened him up to the business, and was also trained early in his career by Jimmy Del Rey. Rising up from the land of the gator, he's a modern day gladiator. 
His first match was a tag team bout February 26, 1989 with his partner the Bubblegum Kid versus the Star Riders. After working in Pro Wrestling Federation and Florida Championship Wrestling, in March 1990 he made his way up to the USWA and began working for Jerry Jarrett. After three months and falling behind on his bills due to low pay, he headed back to Florida broke. And although he made some appearances for WCW, he was unsure if his wrestling career would pan out. He went back to college and began wrestling local shows part time, where he was a heavyweight champion, but wrestling for free. He met a promoter who was sending a group of guys to Japan when one cancelled, so Mike took his spot, which he believed saved his wrestling career. On September of 1990, he debuted in the Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling League in Japan and became known as a gladiator, and would work for them on and off for 9 years. According to Mike, K Fabe was still very much practiced. The heels and the baby faces would take separate buses and rarely even speak before the matches. He debuted in FMW as a monster villain on September 20th in a street fight teamed with Mr. Pogo against Atsushi Onita and Jimmy Backlund, which Mike's team won. He lost to Onita in a chain death match on October the 1st, after which he returned to the United States. Onita was impressed by Mike and called him back for more tours with FMW. He returned to the company as Mr. Pogo's partner in a tag team tournament on January 6, 1991, where the duo lost their first match in the tournament against Onita and Sambo Asako. Pogo and Mike eventually made it to the semi-final, where they defeated Onita and Asako in the final match on January 15th to win the tournament. The success of the tournament is what led him to work full-time with the FMW. He returned to the States for a break and on May 11, 1991, he married his high school sweetheart, Deliza Diane Bowers in Hillsboro, Florida. After his wedding in the summer of that year, Mike returned to Japan and would form a villainous alliance with Tarzan Goto, Big Titan and Horace Boulder after Mr. Pogo's departure from the FMW and resumed the feud with Onita. On August 17th, he participated in the barbed wire deathmatch tournament, which he defeated Horace Boulder in the quarterfinal and lost to Sambo Asako in the semifinal. During this time, Mike was inspired by Damien 666's Lucha Libre videos they watched on bus trips, which led him to adopt a high-flying style despite his big size. In 1993, Mike appeared in NWA Eastern Championship Wrestling for a short period as Awesome Mike Awesome. He was convinced to do so by Sabu, whom he befriended during his time in Japan. After Sabu started working for ECW, he returned to Japan and told Mike about the promotion and how he might want to check it out. Six foot six. Angry and mean, a living, breathing war machine. Made his name in the rising sun with the blood soap battles that he won. Time Although he was initially hesitant, citing lack of interest, Sabu managed to talk Mike into it, who used his frequent flyer miles to go to Philadelphia and wrestle a match for ECW, but was only making $50 an appearance. He returned to Japan and in 1993 formed another faction in FMW called Team Canada with Ricky Fuji, Big Titan, Horace Boulder, Dr. Luther and Dr. Hannibal. In 1994 while in FMW, Mike was involved in the first ever explosion pool death match in a ring floating on pontoons in an Olympic swimming pool, complete with barbed wire and landmines in the water. He would also wrestle the original Sheik on several occasions and the two became very close friends. On February 5, 1994, at ECW's event, The Night the Line Was Crossed, Mike made another appearance in the promotion and nearly injured wrestler J.T. Smith when he performed a high-risk dive to the outside of the ring. Smith's back was folded backwards against a guardrail during the impact. This spot appeared in many ECW highlight reels, including the intro to a variety of their television programs for years to come. According to ECW announcer Joey Styles, his own reaction to the spot inspired his Oh My God catchphrase. Mike did a tryout match in the WWF as an enhancement talent on December 12, 1996, losing to Just Incredible, who was known then as Aldo Montoya, in a dark match for WWF Superstars of Wrestling. But Mike was making good money in Japan and didn't have much interest in joining the WWF at the time. Mike achieved the biggest success of his career in FMW as a gladiator where he became three-time world champion with two reigns as Brass Knuckles heavyweight champion and one reign as independent heavyweight champion. His second Brass Knuckles heavyweight championship reign from 1996 to 1997 was the longest reign in the title's history, lasting for 489 days. By 1997, ECW talent would make regular trips to Japan and appearances in FMW, including Paul Heyman, who was impressed by Mike's work and offered him a job. 
His first feud was with Masato Tanaka, who he had faced in several matches in Japan. In his first pay-per-view, Tanaka powerbombed him over the top rope through a table. In a 2005 interview with High Spots Network, Mike claimed he wasn't even paid for the match, which would become all too common. As later on, Mike even refused to sign a contract with ECW as Heyman wasn't paying him regularly, if at all. Mike returned to FMW on August 26th and wrestled his last FMW match, in which he defeated longtime rival Super Leather for one last tour and broke his ankle and quit. After two weeks back in the US with his ankle barely healed, he went back to ECW and faced Balls Mahoney, where he blew out his knee on the opposite leg. Long before WWE fans were chanting, this is awesome, Mike Awesome was garnering those chants from the most hostile of crowds in Philadelphia. Moreover, he was doing so while main eventing with people like Spike Dudley. That's how awesome he truly was. After a year off to nurse his injuries, he was contacted by Johnny Ace and invited him back to Japan to work for All Japan Pro Wrestling. After a tour with All Japan, Mike returned home and was again contacted by Paul Heyman, at this time wanting him to make him the ECW Heavyweight Champion, and again promised to pay him. After a three-way dance with Tanaka and Taz, Mike was the new ECW Champion. One time and time his hand was raised, all his victims Shortly after winning the belt, and after several weeks of not being paid, Mike received a phone call from his cousin Horace Hogan who was now in WCW and happened to be right next to his Uncle Hulk. Hulk got on the phone to Mike and told him to quit working for free. He introduced him to Eric Bischoff and got him a job with WCW. Because he was never on a contract with ECW, Mike was free to go. Once hired by WCW, he began receiving legal threats from Paul Heyman. Due to concerns over legal issues, WCW refrained from having Mike appear on their television shows with the ECW belt. Eventually, a compromise was reached. According to disclosed figures, his WCW contract was worth just under $280,000. Mike returned to ECW for one night and dropped the title to Taz, who was working for WWF at the time. When Mike showed up for the show, he had to wait outside and was not allowed in the locker room. His only contact with Paul Heyman at this point was through lawyers and faxes. Mike was disappointed having to face Taz as he didn't trust him at all at this point, and would have preferred to face Rhino as he was the only one he could trust. Lance Storm echoed perspective on Mike's decision to abruptly leave the Philadelphia-based promotion and noted that any heat was unjustified. He would state, Mike got a lot of heat for the way he left ECW, but a lot of that was unjustified. The true story is that Mike was owed a significant amount of money from ECW and refused to sign a contract until he received all the money due to him. After repeatedly not receiving money promised to him, Mike accepted an offer from WCW that offered his family financial security. I'm not sure there is anyone in the business who would have done differently. During a video series for Kayfabe Commentaries, Just Incredible noted that Mike Awesome probably lost around $50,000 in unpaid money. His debut was on the April 10, 2000 edition of Nitro, while still technically the ECW World Champion, where he was slated for a top spot. He debuted as a legend killer who feuded with Hogan and Nash. This was also the Nitro reboot, where Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff made the awkward decision to strip all of the champions of their titles to start over with the culmination of several tournaments at the coming of the Spring Stampede pay-per-view. Mike Awesome would debut from the crowd, siding with the New Blood stable and attacking Kevin Nash. Mike competed in the tournament for the United States title but was knocked out in the second round to eventual winner Scott Steiner. In May 2000, Mike threw Canyon off the top of the first level in a triple cage onto the entrance ramp, which solidified his career killer gimmick. But after the incident at the Bash of the Beach in 2000 and creative differences between Hulk Hogan and Vince Russo, Horace was fired and being close to Hulk and staying close to him backstage after the match was over to make sure nothing happened to Hogan put Mike in Vince Russo's bad books. Mike went from the career killer to the fat chick thriller. According to Eric Bischoff in his 83 Weeks podcast, Mike never complained and did what he was supposed to do. Mike would later state he felt uncomfortable and felt bad about making fat jokes about the woman they paired him up with. After passing Russo in the hallway, Vince pulled him aside and told him he was going to make him that 70s guy, complete with his own talk show segment, The Lava Lounge. Somehow Mike continued to amaze fans and create memorable wrestling moments. No one will ever forget the insane clown posse being powerbombed on top of Mike's 1970s Partridge Family style bus. Shaggy would actually slide off and legitimately hurt himself. Mike was making a mountain out of a molehill. 
On the January 3rd, 2001 edition of Thunder, Mike dropped the 1970s gimmick in favor of a Canadian career killer gimmick and joined WCW's Team Canada stable with Lance Storm and Elix Skipper. A feud with the Filthy Animals led to Mike challenging Billy Kidman to a hair vs. hair match on January 15th. However, before the bout could take place, Team Canada attacked Kidman backstage, leaving him unable to compete. Kidman's bald stablemate Conan replaced him and got the win, giving the Animals the right to cut off Mike's longtime mullet. Mike then faded into the background, mostly helping Storm in his battles against Ernest the Cat Miller. On the final Nitro on March 26, 2001, Mike and Storm were defeated by Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare in a WCW World Tag Team Championship match. WCW had hired Johnny Ace and in 2001, Mike believed things would turn around for him. He cut his mullet and was paired with Lance Storm, but unbeknownst to him, the company was bought out by Vince McMahon and everything changed. When the company was bought out by the WWF, Mike was one of the first wrestlers to get a phone call and offered a job. According to Mike, the politics in the WWF locker room made for a tense work environment. After the March 2001 purchase of WCW by the World Wrestling Federation, Mike became part of the Invasion storyline in the WWF. His WWF debut came on the June 25, 2001 episode of Raw during a match which saw Test defending his hardcore championship against Rhino. After Rhino gored Test against a wall and pinned him, he stood celebrating his new title, only to be attacked by Mike wielding a metal pipe. He then powerbombed Rhino onto a ladder and pinned him, becoming the champion himself due to the 24-7 rule. Mike was the first WCW talent to gain gold in the WWF, getting away with a hardcore belt before any WWF wrestlers could catch him. Mike's hardcore reign came to an end a few weeks later on the July 12th edition of SmackDown when he was pinned by Jeff Hardy, thanks to a distraction by Edge. Mike defeated Edge on the July 16th episode of Raw. The feud continued when Edge introduced his tag team partner Christian into the rivalry. Mike and Lance Storm were defeated by Christian and Edge at Invasion on July 22nd, Mike's first WWF pay-per-view match. From there, Mike's push diminished and appearing mostly on WWF's B-shows. Mike re-injured his knee in a match with The Big Show on November 2001, which would cost him six months on the shelf. When he returned, he became the ECW Heavyweight Champion, but in his opinion, he was just a transitional champion. Mike believed he was held back creatively in the WWF and was not able to give the fans the type of matches they wanted. Mike returned to the SmackDown brand on the July 27, 2002 edition of Velocity, where he was defeated by Tajiri. Mike was a mainstay on Velocity, SmackDown's B-Show, for the next few months, jobbing to wrestlers such as Farouk, Bull Buchanan, Mark Henry, and Funaki. Mike was released from the WWF on September 27, 2002, along with Sean Stasiak and Horace Hogan. Mike was quoted saying, being in the WWF sucked. I hated it. You had to kiss everybody's ass. You had to be on your political toes at all times. You would not believe the backstage politics. You were getting stabbed in the back constantly. I was so happy when I was told I was gone. Between blowing out his knee, having Paul Heyman in the office, and not being able to wrestle the style of matches he wanted to, he saw the writing on the wall. From 2002 until 2005, Mike competed on the independent circuit in the United States and Japan, where he returned to All Japan Pro Wrestling as a gladiator once again. He had a short stint with Major League Wrestling, where he won the MLW World Heavyweight Championship from Satoshi Kojima, only to lose it 10 minutes later to Steve Carino. In April 2003, Mike debuted in Total Nonstop Action Wrestling. He wrestled several matches for the promotion before leaving in May 2003. His TNA in-ring debut was on April 16th of that year, where he defeated Perry Saturn by DQ, when the Sandman and New Jack interfered. On April 23rd, Mike teamed with Brian Lee and Slash in a losing effort against Perry Saturn, New Jack and the Sandman. On May 14th, Mike competed in his final TNA match where he lost to Mike Sanders in a tables match, after he returned to All Japan and had no more problems with his knee. Mike made an appearance at the ECW One Night Stand reunion pay-per-view on June 13, 2005, defeating Masato Tanaka. The crowd greeted Mike with jeers at the beginning of the match and commentator Joey Styles made frequent references to Mike's leaving of ECW for WCW, but by the end of the match the crowd were chanting this match rules and gave both men a standing ovation. His last match was in 2005. 
In February 2006, Mike announced his retirement from wrestling, saying he wanted to spend more time with his family and adding that he felt underpaid for his work at the one night stand only event and that he would only return to the ring if the money was right. After his retirement, Mike got a job with Coldwell Banker as a real estate salesman. Around that time, his marriage to his wife was beginning to fall apart. One day in 2007, she told him that she was leaving him. This apparently caught Mike completely by surprise as he thought his marriage was fine. The two argued and Mike allegedly grabbed her by the throat and threw her up against the wall. She wound up calling the police and they arrested him on charges of domestic violence. While in jail, he called his wife and she allegedly told him that she hated him and was divorcing him and taking their two children with her. According to Lance Storm, Mike seemed to be a very happy and loyal family man. When he was released from jail, Mike returned home to find an empty house with much of their money and belongings all gone. Reports say that she also went as far as to throw away and destroy some of his personal possessions. Completely despondent, Mike committed suicide by hanging himself. His friends discovered his body in his home. He was just 42 years old. WWE acknowledged his death on the February 20th broadcast of ECW on Sci-Fi at the opening of the program. Mike was an avid gamer, outdoorsman, and enjoyed fishing and trail bike riding and would ride frequently at Alafia River State Park in Florida, close to his Tampa home. He left behind a son and daughter. That was the story of Michael Alfonso, a.k.a. Mike Awesome. Rising up from the land of the gator, he's a modern day gladiator. Six foot six and grim mean, a living, breathing war machine. Made his name in the rising sun with the blood soaked battles that he won. Time and time his hand was raised, all his victims felt his rage. Awesome's what they say, all the sticks are filled the painage with an awesome bomb, and you're never the same. Awesome's what they say, all the sticks are filled the painage with an awesome bomb, and you're never the same. This is Brett the Hitman Hart, and you're watching another original wrestling documentary. Edward Fatu, known to his friends and family as Eki, performed under the ring name Umaga. As a younger brother of the Tonga Kid and Rikishi, and a nephew of Afa and Sika of the Wild Samoans, wrestling was in his blood. He made his in-ring debut in 1994 in his uncle's promotion, World Extreme Wrestling. He would appear in Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling in Japan when him and his cousin Matt formed a tag team calling themselves Armageddon. They would later join the WWF and be known as 3 Minute Warning. Throughout his career, he would perform under several ring monikers such as ECMO, Jamal, but most notably from 2006 to 2009 in the WWE where he wrestled as Umaga and would reach main event status. Arguably one of the highlights of his career was WrestleMania 23 when he represented Vince McMahon in the Battle of the Billionaires. He was released from his contract in WWE after violating its wellness policy and refusing to enter treatment. He wrestled his last match in November 2009 on the Hulkamania tour in Australia. The next month he would be found unresponsive by his wife and taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. According to his autopsy report, a combination of heart disease and a deadly mixture of three different types of prescription medication led to his untimely passing. Eddie was a continuation of a disturbing pattern of wrestlers passing before the age of 40 due to drugs or painkiller abuse. Umaga is the Samoan meaning for the end, which is a tragic parallel to the life of Eddie Fatu. At the time, many considered him to be the best worker in the family. During his relatively short run as Umaga throughout WWE's ruthless aggression era, he became one of the most unforgettable characters to fans, but seemingly forgotten by the company after his passing. Known in the ring as a Samoan bulldozer, but behind the curtain he was known as one of the most sweethearted men in the industry. This is the story of Eddie Fatu. Professional wrestler Edward Fatu, who performed under the name Umaga, died Friday at a Houston hospital, said a WWE spokesman. A family friend said Fatu was found unresponsive at home by his family and never regained consciousness. Doctors indicated that he died of a heart attack. He was just 36.
Edward Fatu was born in American Samoa on March 28, 1973. His mother, Vera Fatu, was a sister of Afa and Sika of the Wild Samoans, who in the span of their career captured 21 tag team titles throughout various promotions. Being the younger brother of WWE Hall of Famer Rikishi and the legendary Tonga Kid, wrestling was in his blood. The family would go on to produce some of the greatest performers of all time, including Yokozuna, Roman Reigns, and the Uso brothers, among others. In November 1992, he was married, and early the following year, him and his wife had their first of four children. He trained under his uncle Afa and began wrestling in his World Extreme Wrestling promotion in 1995. He formed a tag team with his cousin Matt, who would later be known as Rosie. He had tremendous agility, speed, and endurance for his size. According to The Observer, Kim Wood, an assistant coach with the Cincinnati Bengals at the time, commented upon seeing him work on Les Thatcher shows, that somehow he must have slipped through the system because a guy that size and agility should be in the NFL. He and his cousin Matt dominated the tag team division everywhere they went. In March of 1999, the duo made their Japan debut in Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling in a tag team tournament, calling themselves Armageddon 1 and 2. In May of 2000, he would perform under the name Eddie Fatu, while his cousin as Matty Samu, and known as the Samoans, briefly capturing the WEW Hardcore Tag Team titles before dropping them and leaving Japan. The following year, still calling themselves the Samoans, they would have a WWF tryout match at a house show in Columbus, Georgia, losing to Charlie and Ross Haas. They officially signed developmental contracts with the World Wrestling Federation and were assigned to Heartland Wrestling Association, adopting the tag team name The Island Boys, now using the ring names ECMO and Chemo. Throughout 2001, they would make a handful of appearances in WWF, both on Jacked and Sunday Night Heat. They won the HWA Tag Team Championship in November of 2001 by defeating Evan Courageous and Shannon Moore. They also competed for Memphis Championship Wrestling, holding the MCW Southern Tag Team Championship on three occasions. According to the Bleacher Report, when Ross Haas died from a heart attack, the three people that found him dead were Lance Cade, Charlie Haas, and Eddie. Since that time, Haas said that Lance Cade and Eddie were his two best friends. While the WWF changed its title to the WWE, the cousins would also be given new names. Eddie was renamed Jamal and Matt renamed Rosie, and they made their main roster debut on the July 22, 2002 episode of Raw as Three Minute Warning, a team of nefarious hoodlums. They were hired as enforcers for Eric Bischoff, attacking random wrestlers each week. After Bischoff gave people three minutes to entertain him, or they would face being ambushed by the duo. They attacked countless wrestlers at the command of Bischoff, including D'Lo Brown and Sean Stasiak. The team had a memorable run as Three Minute Warning. Their last match was on Sunday Night Heat on May 26, 2003, losing to Maven and Tommy Dreamer. The WWE dropped the angle. He was released and the company began filling its roster with new talent from its developmental territory. For the time being, him and his cousin Matt would go their own separate ways. Matt would remain in the WWE and embark in a superhero in training angle with Gregory Helms. To avoid any legal issues with WWE, Eddie would change his ring name from Jamal to ECMO and wrestled a handful of matches in MLW, teaming with both Mana and Samu. In October of 2003, he would sign with TNA and form a team with Sunny Siaki. Later that year, he would return to All Japan Pro Wrestling as Jamal, forming several short-lived tag teams with Just Incredible, Teo Key, Buchanan, and D'Lo Brown. He would spend most of 2004 and 2005 working for All Japan Pro Wrestling, but would make brief appearances during his trips back to the US and TNA, as well as a handful of appearances for NWE during their Destiny tour in Europe. He returned to WWE in December 2005, signing a new deal. At first, the plans were he and his cousin Matt were rehashing their three-minute warning gimmick, but after seeing him in a squash match and the improvement he had made in the ring, 
Vince McMahon decided to pull the plug on the plans and groom him for a big run as a singles wrestler, now calling himself Umaga. He would be featured as a Samoan character, similar to that of his uncles, uncontrollable and spoke no English, which made it impossible for a ref to do anything about his attacks. According to The Observer, an idea was constructed that Gary Hart would form a heel stable with Umaga as its top gun called Black Friday Management. The concept was to portray Gary Hart as a Don King type with a criminal vibe and dress him like Suge Knight with a mob style business suit, with the idea that he was independent of WWE and bringing talent to the organization. There was also an idea that Hart would be accompanied by a hot Asian girl based on Gogo Yubari, the Catholic schoolgirl assassin in Kill Bill. Hart felt he physically couldn't do it and had moved on. Vince McMahon was never warmed to the idea because Hart was originally going to be the manager of Earthquake John Tenta at one point. Hart showed up at the airport in the city for his debut taping and nobody was there to pick him up. When he finally got to the arena, already mad about the treatment, he got into an argument with Jay Strongbow, left the building and went home. Hart still followed wrestling until his death but had no interest in being a part of it. He was paired with Armando Estrada and the two ended up having good chemistry. Over the next year, Umaga and Armando ran over mid and lower card WWE talent. During his first year with the company, many observers noted that he moved quicker and better than any other man his size. His gimmick and heritage combined made him a shoe in for the top tier of the WWE. Estrada was a great talker and they didn't want Umaga to speak English in order to get over the savage gimmick. Later, they spent literally months trying to figure out some sort of way to get him to speak. And then suddenly, one day out of nowhere, he just cut a normal promo. Umaga gained victories over all of Raw's top performers including Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and John Cena, who was still champion at the time. He also ended up sending Kane to SmackDown after winning a Loser Leaves Raw match. On the February 19th episode of Raw, Umaga was announced as Vince McMahon's frontman for Battle of the Billionaires with Donald Trump at WrestleMania 23. Instantly after selecting Umaga, McMahon granted him a match against the Intercontinental Champion Jeff Hardy, and four minutes later, he was crowned the new Intercontinental Champion. This would be the beginning of an enormous push he would receive that year. For the next several weeks, he would face John Cena during main events during house shows. His career peaked in WrestleMania 23 when he and Bobby Lashley were the surrogates for Vince McMahon and Donald Trump in the hair vs hair match, which was the biggest money drawing match in the history of the industry, doing 1.2 million buys on pay per view. Even though he lost, he was featured on the show's main event, further upping his status in the company. On April 16, 2007, on a Raw episode from Milan, Italy, his opponent was picked from the crowd by Vince McMahon. He said his name was Santino Morella. At first glimpse, this looked like it was going to be another squash match. But with interference by Bobby Lashley, he lost the match and his title. For the next month, Santino would achieve seemingly accidental wins to keep the title while being paraded as an innocent childlike personality who is smaller in stature and not experienced enough to mix it up with seasoned veterans. He even locked out and won a successful title defense against Umaga before losing the belt back to him in a return match on July 2, 2007. Eddie remained a high card performer and most notably in a feud with Jeff Hardy in late 2007, having some great encounters including a Falls Count Anywhere match at the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. Over the following months, Eddie would suffer a couple of injuries which would keep him off TV and lower his standing within the WWE ranks, but with more injuries came more painkillers. In an August 2007 article by Sports Illustrated and the Washington Post, Eddie was named as a number of pro wrestlers and other professional athletes to have purchased pharmaceuticals from an online pharmacy. He was reported to have received a growth hormone between July and December 2006. This was his first violation of the wellness policy. He was suspended for 30 days and immediately lost the Intercontinental title to Jeff Hardy on the September 2nd episode of Raw. His first match back was a title shot against Triple H at the No Mercy pay-per-view, in which he came up short. Eddie's push seemed to be over, although he was still in high-profile matches, his status as a main eventer was slipping away. 
He would be written in a countless one-shot angles and even form a short-lived team with Randy Orton, but mostly be putting over other superstars like Triple H and Jeff Hardy. In February of 2008, it appeared his career was back on track as he competed in the main event on the No Way Out pay-per-view in the Elimination Chamber match. The next week on Raw, he would squash D.H. Smith in under two minutes and Super Crazy the next week in 41 seconds. On April 26th, while participating in the WrestleMania Revenge Tour across Europe, Eddie received word his mother, Vera Fatu, passed away. He immediately flew home to be with his family. Two weeks later, he was back on the road. In July, he was sent from Raw to SmackDown for a headlining feud with The Undertaker. But on August 2nd, 2008, he suffered a torn PCL from a bad landing outside the ring in a match in Johnson City, Tennessee. After being examined by WWE's Dr. Martha Dodson, a sports medicine specialist, she decided he didn't require surgery. It was reported he would go through rehabilitation instead. She would go on to say, The concern of anyone with an injury such as this will be coming back too soon, because you could worsen the injury or actually suffer more injuries to the rest of the knee, said Dodson. In his situation, because of his level of competition, it would not only be very painful to return, but could potentially worsen other injuries. I think a minimum of four to six weeks is a pretty rapid time for him to get back into action. But like most men and women who fill top spots on the roster, any time missed can be career suicide. So Eddie did what most top tier talent did and used painkillers to minimize his time away from the company. And he was back in the ring in less than a month, which would prove to be a mistake. After a series of house shows against Gregory Helms, he spent the rest of 2008 nursing the torn ligament, making only a couple of appearances. Custom Muscle is your wholesale distributor, not only for superstars of the WWE, but for health and fitness enthusiasts everywhere. With our wide range of sports nutrition and supplement products, top of the line protein and energy drinks, Custom Muscle was designed for everyone's needs, no matter who you are or what you're trying to accomplish. From training tips to diet nutrition advice to forums and everyday health related topics, we will help you customize your muscle needs. Visit us at custommuscle.com. On October 1st, 2008, while still recovering from his injury, him and longtime friend Charlie Haas became business partners in an attempt to plan for his future outside the WWE and still be able to provide for his family. They opened up a vitamin and supplement store which also incorporated a smoothie bar and online forum. The store was located in Frisco, Texas. Eddie returned to the WWE for a short time in January to build up a match with Triple H, but after that, Creative didn't have any ideas for him. One problem he faced throughout his run as Umaga that became more prevalent during his series of matches with Helms was the crowd cheered him over the babyface. When he was supposed to be portrayed as a heel, that created a problem with WWE writers. February 6th on SmackDown, he would face Funaki, which turned out to be a squash. Fans cheered for Umaga, although it sounded like WWE tried to drown them out. Dave Meltzer would note in the February 16th Observer, Umaga had trimmed down. On the February 20th edition of SmackDown, he faced Scotty Goldman, aka Colt Cabana. Vince hated the first match they did and made them go out and do it again which Colt Cabana probably knew was the beginning of the end for him. Umaga ended it quickly in a completely one-sided match. He took another hiatus in April to deal with the problems he was having with his torn ligament. He was brought back in May for a feud with CM Punk before Punk's heel turn. The way the Triple H and Punk feuds were booked, it made it clear his stock had dropped, and because The Undertaker was out now with an injury, their storyline was put on hold. According to The Observer, there was a feeling he had returned out of shape and was noticeably slower in the ring. On the May 22nd SmackDown show, he spoke English, breaking his Samoan wildman gimmick, even though allowing him to speak English had been talked about for more than a year beforehand. In the May 26th Observer, Dave Meltzer would write, Why is Umaga talking? Gimmick killed. Realistically, this makes no difference, but it upsets me that instead of getting this guy a great manager, now he's just talking and breathing heavy into the mic. Worse, when he left up the ramp, he started ranting and raving. On the June 7th Extreme Rules pay-per-view show in New Orleans, he lost a Samoan strap match to CM Punk that he was originally scheduled to win. 
The next day it was announced he had been released due to failing a drug test, but he claimed to family and friends he quit. He was given a choice to go to rehab or not, and decided not to. As reported on WWE.com on Monday, June 8, 2009, WWE superstar Umaga, Eddie Fatu, has been released from his World Wrestling Entertainment contract. However, consistent with the practice of announcing wellness policy violations, it should be noted that Umaga's termination was due to his second violation of the WWE wellness program and his refusal to enter a rehabilitation facility. But the chance to return would come when he signed to do the Hulkamania tour. He was one of several of the wrestlers on the tour contacted by the WWE with pressure put on them not to do the tour. However, all the names announced, including Eddie, had signed contracts, so he kept his commitments. He was expected to return at the next year's Royal Rumble. Everyone liked him, and Hogan said that he wanted to get him into TNA. There was certainly interest from that side. But Eddie told people there was no way he was going there and that he was heading back to the WWE as soon as the tour was over. He told others on tour that he had too much loyalty to the McMahons, in particular saying that he felt a degree of loyalty to Stephanie and Triple H, who gave him his biggest career opportunity, and that he would be returning there even though Hulk Hogan was still attempting to recruit him. His final match was on November 28, 2009 in Sydney, Australia. He had just returned home from the tour when he suffered a heart attack at his home in Texas. He was found by his wife on December 4th, and despite their best attempts, paramedics were unable to revive him. The heart attack was so severe that the family was called once he was admitted into the hospital and told to fly in because he wouldn't last much longer. He was being kept alive through life support, but suffered a second heart attack the next day. The final autopsy report listing his death as accidental, caused by acute toxicity due to the combined effects of somas, Vicodin, and Valium. He also had heart issues, including an enlarged heart, which is common among young wrestlers' deaths, as well as kidney failure, and his liver went into shock, likely from the heart attack. There is no evidence of him having consumed alcohol the night he died. His death was a major heartbreak to the family, which had a series of tragedies in a short period of time, including the death of Vera Fatu, his mother, and the sister of Afa and Sika, seven months earlier from cancer. Afa wrote, On behalf of my family, we are devastated and shocked by the loss of our Eki. Our son, nephew, brother, cousin, husband, father. Our hearts are broken and words can't express what each of us are feeling. It is so comforting to know how loved Eki is by his family, peers, friends, and most of all his fans. When I received that AM phone call that my nephew was in the hospital, I dug deep and prayed and cried and begged for a miracle. When we lost Eki, I knew it was God's will and that he is with my sister, his mother who passed within the last year. We are making plans now for our farewell to Eki, but I wanted to take this time to thank everyone for all the thousands of posts, emails, letters and cards. Although I've not been able to bring myself to answer them personally, your kindness does not go unnoticed. I want to especially thank our WWE family and Stephanie McMahon for everything and her phone call was very comforting to me in my time of sorrow. God bless each and every one of you. I've said it a hundred times, the best people in the world are our wrestling people. You'll never find a more dedicated group of people. Be safe and healthy and love one another. During an episode of Talk is Jericho, former WWE writer Court Bauer stated Vince McMahon was torn apart by Eddie's death. He would go on to say, I vividly remember when he passed away, and I remember how legit sad Vince was about it, because at the time, I think they had let him go because he wouldn't go to rehab, and I remember Vince really saying like, I tried, I did not want this to happen, I couldn't do anything, like if you're not going to go do it on your own, there's nothing we can do. During his last match when he pinned Ken Anderson, Anderson commented how spooky it was that he had Umaga and Eddie Guerrero's final match before either man died. Eddie would be instrumental in bringing his two nephews, Jonathan and Joshua Fatu, known professionally as Jimmy and Jey Uso, to the WWE. According to Rikishi, his younger brother was always close with his sons. While he was away in Pensacola and planning to return to Houston, he told the twins, who were installing office furniture at the time, it was now or never. They packed their bags, 
said goodbye to their families, and embarked on the 10-hour drive to Houston with their uncle and never looked back. They trained at Booker T School and the next year made their debut in Florida Championship Wrestling. Their success was bittersweet as the same day they signed their contracts with the WWE was the same day Eddie passed away. The brothers have become one of the most entertaining tag teams on the WWE roster and both critics and peers consider them to be one of the best tag teams in WWE history. Eddie was well liked and respected by those who worked closely with him in the WWE. Despite his previous tenure and respect within the company, WWE did not acknowledge his death on television in any way, which one can speculate was for PR reasons, which will forever remain a sore point with some of his family members and his fans around the world. In the 2009 awards issue of The Observer, Dave Meltzer would list WWE not acknowledging the death of Umaga on TV, the number four most disgusting promotional tactic. Eddie leaves behind a legacy in the Samoan dynasty that many say is one of the biggest contributions of this decade, not only making a huge impact during his time as an upper card talent, but without Eddie, the Uso brothers could very well still be assembling office furniture. As well, in following family tradition, his son Zilla is currently training at Booker T School in Texas and hopes to join his cousins in the bloodline. That was the story of Eddie Fatu. Louis Vincent Albano was an Italian-American professional wrestler, manager, and actor who performed under the name Captain Lou Albano. After being expelled from the University of Tennessee for attempting to cheat on a final exam and then joining the Army only to be honorably discharged eight months later, Lou began training in 1953 as a boxer, but the promoters were hesitant because he was under six feet, so future WWF President Willie Gilsenberg encouraged him to get into wrestling. Originally billed as Leaping Lou Albano, the Mount Vernon Mauler, and later Lou Albano, using a gangster image until real members of the Mafia requested him to change his gimmick. Having little success as a wrestler, he became a manager at the suggestion of Bruno Sammartino and went on to manage over a dozen tag team champions spanning over four decades. After starring in a Cyndi Lauper video in the mid-1980s, the two became very close friends and he was instrumental in the creation of the Rock and Wrestling Connection, which defined pop culture during the 1980s. He appeared in several movies and TV shows, as well as the host of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. According to Dave Meltzer, without Lou Albano, wrestling history would have been monumentally different. One of the most iconic personalities and most influential managers ever in the history of the business, often imitated and never duplicated, this is the untold story of Captain Lou Albano. Lou was born in Rome, Italy on July 29, 1933. Though his parents were both American-born, his family was in Italy at the time of his birth while his father pursued his medical degree. His mother, Eleanor, was a classic concert pianist who had performed at the Carnegie Hall and later became a registered nurse. His father, Carmen, was a physician who delivered over 6,000 babies. He later co-patented a four-steps instrument to assist in breech birth deliveries. Lou had eight other siblings, but only five lived until adulthood. He was baptized in the Vatican, and his parents returned to the New York City area shortly thereafter, aboard the RMS Majestic. The family settled in the Mount Vernon area. Lou attended Archie Bishop Stepanek High School in White Plains, New York, where he competed in track and field and football, where he was team captain. It was this position that later inspired his wrestling gimmick, Captain Lou Albano. He was so talented that he received 32 offers of full scholarships from universities around the country. He chose the University of Tennessee based on the strength of their football team. His team included the likes of Darius McCord and Doug Atkins. But his college career was cut short when, after several conflicts with the dean for poor behavior, he was caught cheating on an exam, which resulted in him being expelled. Now that football was no longer a viable option in Lou's life, he joined the Army, but because of a childhood injury, he was discharged after only eight months. 
Lou's father, Carmen, wanted to open up an insurance agency and have Lou run it. But not wanting to give up on his dreams of becoming a professional athlete, Lou decided to begin training as a boxer. But standing at only 5'10", other boxers towered over him. Before another door slammed in his face, he met boxing promoter Willie Gilsenberg, future Worldwide Wrestling Federation president, who suggested Lou might want to try his luck in pro wrestling. In the early 1950s, Lou began working for the WWWF. Antonio Roca was Albano's first TV opponent. Lou tried to lay out some spots for himself, but promoter Jack Pfeiffer made it sternly clear that Albano was not to get in any offense. Lou told his friends he was going to work on TV, and they all assumed he would be making as much as a thousand bucks for being a TV star. Lou ended up being paid $25. He cried foul and ended up being blackballed by Vince Sr. for six months because he complained. After expenses, he came away with 13 bucks for the day. Lou got some work in Canada during the winter, but the weather was brutal. After a forgettable run as a singles wrestler, Vince Sr. suggested Lou go to Chicago for a chance to expand his career. It was there he formed the Sicilians with Tony Altimore. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these uh, dudes I've got up here with me now are known as the Sicilians. And uh, who's the spokesman? We know we have the ability to beat these guys. We just want the chance to pull, but we're out here for one purpose, to beat these guys and to bring the title back to Sicily where it belongs. Do you think, uh, right. do you think that you're in the same league with a couple of champions? There's no, nobody in our league. league. What do you mean in the league. same league? What's the matter with you? What are you talking about? What league? We are the greatest tag team in the country today, in the world! Tell, all right, tell me, tell me first of all, who did you beat? We're beating from the top of the country. Names are immaterial, but we beat them all. and we beat them. They had a mob gimmick of two stereotypical mob goons, but had to tone down some of their gimmick. Not only were they hated by the fans, real members of the mob were upset at being represented in a negative light. Despite the fact that they were holding the Midwest tag titles, the threat was taken seriously, and afraid for their well-being, they hightailed it back to the Northeast without even dropping the belts. The Sicilians had a good run when they returned to the WWWF, even briefly capturing the United States tag titles. Bob Orton Jr. recalled an incident where Lou went to the ring with a gun and saved his dad Bob Orton Sr. who was a heel from unruly fans. He would state, That night in particular, dad dropped two straight falls and still had so much heat that when he left some guy was standing up in the bleachers and hit him in the head with a chair, which knocked dad out. And Lou Albano went out with a gun and a couple of guys. Dad's knees were scraped to the bone where they had dragged him out of there. But if Lou wouldn't have went out there with a the gun and made people back off, they might have killed him. From that night on, he never got that deep, serious heat because he knew it was too dangerous. In 1962, Lou's father had a head-on collision when a car in the oncoming traffic swerved into his lane and Dr. Carmen Albano was killed instantly. In 1963, Lou and Altimore appeared on the Jackie Gleason Scene magazine show as Sandpiper Sam Staccato and Altimore as referee Harry Hornet. Even back in those days, Lou believed crossing over into mainstream would serve him and the business well. This basic equation would repeat itself throughout Lou's career. Later in the 1960s, Bruno Sammartino told Lou that he wasn't a good wrestler, but liked Lou's talking and suggested he become a manager. Sammartino recalled, One day I said to Vince Sr., This guy Lou Albano isn't the best wrestler. As a team, they can only go so far, but he'd be a great mouthpiece for some guy. Lou had such a gift of gab that he can help out some people. As a wrestler, he just seemed limited. He was always the same. He was never looked upon by promoters as someone who could be anything special. But as a manager, he shined. That was his calling. Lou realizing that wrestlers only had a limited lifespan in the ring and still dealing with his old football injury agreed. Although it was his decision to split up his 10-year tag team partnership with Altimore, the two remained very close friends until his death in 2003. By 1969, the Sicilians had dissolved the team, and Albano dubbed himself Captain Lou. His character was that of an Italian thug. He wore silk shirts, fur coats, and big watches. The manager role was a perfect fit for pro wrestling's territorial area. 
Bruno Sammartino was a WWF mainstay, but his heel opponents were often brought in from other territories on short-term contracts. And once the angle was over, they would fade away, usually leaving for another territory, keeping the angles fresh. Lou became Bruno's longtime rival and hardly ever had to set foot in the ring. Under Lou's management, Ivan Koloff defeated Bruno for the heavyweight title, but Koloff's title reign was a transitional one, lasting just three weeks. The shock of Koloff's victory was such that the crowd fell totally silent, and Bruno even momentarily feared that he had lost his hearing. Koloff and Lou were quickly rushed out of the ring by security without the championship belt as the crowd began to riot. Lou, his wife and a family friend, who were both in attendance, escaped to a taxi outside the garden. The mob surrounded the cab and began breaking windows, so the trio ran to a nearby bar, followed by the crowd who were pelting them with mud and objects. The mob was beginning to destroy the bar as the police finally arrived. Vince McMahon received a bill for damages totaling $27,000, cementing Lou's unapparelled ability to arouse anger from the audience. Koloff would lose the title a short time after to Pedro Morales. That was the first and only time Lou ever managed a heavyweight champion. He would go on to manage both Greg the Hammer Valentine and Don Morocco when they were intercontinental champions and would also manage an astounding 17 tag team champions. Around this time, managers were relatively rare in the pro wrestling world. WWF only had two others. However, a promising new wrestler, Oscar Crusher Verdu, had just recently immigrated from Spain. His in-ring capabilities were hampered by a limited command of English, and Lou was assigned to be his mouthpiece. Lou emphasized Verdu's physique and insisted that he had never been taken off his feet during a match. To rile up audiences, he also engaged in ethnic slurs, which were then more of a common part of the WWF banter. Lou promised that Verdu would stomp on that Italian, referring to San Martino. The fact that Lou was also Italian himself only heightened the audience's reaction. Bruno later said, they wanted to see me beat the hell out of Verdu to make Albano a liar. He could get the kind of heat that nobody else could. The result was a Madison Square Garden sellout when Verdu faced San Martino in June 1970, the first for the company in five years, and then record gate for a wrestling event in that arena. The record only lasted a month when a rematch brought in over $85,000 in ticket receipts. After losing that match, Verdu cycled out of the WWF rotation, but Lou remained as a top heel manager for the next 15 years. Even as a heel, some would say especially as a heel, Lou was a ball of charisma. Long frazzled mane, Hawaiian shirts unbuttoned, rubber bands tying off his unkept goatee, and more dangling rubber bands and even safety pins from his face. Underneath he still had the streetwise thuggish personality he portrayed in his singles wrestling run, but had owned his microphone skills to make him one of the true greats of his era. He looked like your average tough uncle who could actually throw his weight around, but yet hid behind his protégés. Another protege of Lou was Iron Mike McCord. A memorable match in 1974 featured Chief J. Strongbow applying his famous sleeper hold on Mike McCord, but Lou interfered in the match by smashing an arm cast over Strongbow's forehead, causing him to bleed badly. It was previously alleged by Albano that Strongbow had since jumped him in the locker room, breaking Lou's arm in the process. But during the match, McCord was disqualified because of outside interference. Strongbow was cut open by Lou's bloody blows. Later, Strongbow settled the score by challenging him to put on the wrestling tights once again. And the stage was set in front of a sold-out crowd at Madison Square Garden, where he defeated Captain Lou Albano quite convincingly. In the early 1980s, Lou wrestled a handful of both singles and tag team matches, teaming with the Moondogs, Fuji and Saito, and even Ray Stevens. In 1984, Lou met pop singer Cindy Lauper on a plane flight from Puerto Rico. Her manager, David Wolf suggested that the two collaborate on a project at some point in the future. He appeared in several of her music videos and played her dad in the music video for the single Girls Just Want to Have Fun. She appeared on Roddy Piper's Piper's Pit program to discuss the collaboration. Lou, in character, began degrading Lopper and women in general and claimed to have written all of her songs and been the only reason for her success. Lopper, in turn, assaulted Albano with her purse and the two agreed to settle their differences in the ring. Albano and Lopper agreed to compete by proxy, each choosing a female wrestler to contend. Lopper would choose Wendy Richter, while Albano chose a fabulous moolah. The match, scheduled for July 23, 1984, was dubbed the Brawl to End It All, and would be broadcast live on MTV. During the match, Lopper interfered on Richter's behalf by hitting moolah in the head with her purse dubbed the Loaded Purse of Doom. At the conclusion of the match, Richter had defeated moolah for the WWF Women's Championship, which the WWF had promoted Mula as having held for the previous 28 years. You recognize this lovely melody? 
Well, I don't either. And furthermore, I don't care. The only thing I care about is NRBQ. Round the records. NRBQ till it was maybe. For a time in the 1980s, Lou also managed the rock group NRBQ. The group recorded a 1986 album, Lou and the Q, which contained a song titled Captain Lou, on which Albano himself sings and rants. In the meantime, Lou had become involved in several charities. His brother's brother-in-law had recently died of multiple sclerosis, and the experience led Lou to lend his time to raising awareness and funds to combat the disease, occasionally alongside Lopper. Smash it, we're gonna kick it. We're gonna knock it off the face of the earth. We're gonna do more than that, Lou. We're gonna bust MS. Bust MS. Bust MS. Bust MS. His increasingly public benevolence clashed with his in-ring persona, which violated the principles of kayfabe, maintaining the appearance of reality within professional wrestling, which was still strictly adhered to at the time. In 1984, Lou decided it was time, after 32 years as a heel, to turn face. He therefore arranged for Lopper to receive an in-ring award for contributions to both wrestling and the fight against MS, for which he also came out and congratulated her. In the course of the ceremony, Roddy Piper came into the ring to sarcastically praise Albano before breaking Lopper's award, a gold record plaque over his head. Lopper and her boyfriend manager David Wolf were also attacked by Piper and Orton. The melee was broken up by Hulk Hogan, but the altercation allowed for Lou to now wrestle and manage as a crowd favorite. His last two heel protégés, Valentine and Ken Patera, were paired with Jimmy Hart and Bobby Heenan, respectively, after Albano's face turn. Although he continued his overblown rambling interviews, one of the lead announcers for the WWF, Gorilla Monsoon, continued to refer to Albano as the fountain of misfortune. Lou was now leading fan favorites such as the U.S. Express, George Steele, the British Bulldogs, Hulk Hogan, and Andre the Giant into battle. The U.S. Express and the British Bulldogs became the first tag teams to win the WWF Tag Team Championships with Lou as the face manager. The year 1985 saw the debut of the cartoon Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, which included Hulk Hogan and his band of fan favorites, including Captain Lou, and Rowdy Roddy Piper's team of bad guy all-stars. Sold to children on Saturday mornings, wrestlers were injected into the mainstream. Their portrayals were borderline inauthentic, and the wrestlers didn't even voice their on-screen characters. This was followed in short order by wrestlers on talk shows, award shows. It was the ultimate victory for the rock and wrestling movement, and in the middle of it all was Captain Lou Albano, now sporting tight t-shirts with his own image. Behind the scenes, he was the WWF's ambassador into the music world. Even though Hogan was appearing on MTV and commercials, Lou was the era's true crossover star. He would highlight it all with appearances on Miami Vice, 227, and in movies like Wise Guys and Body Slam. Lou left the WWF in late 1986 with one final match on an episode of Wrestling Challenge that aired in November teaming the British Bulldogs to defeat the Dream Team and luscious Johnny Valiant. Lou would then make a one-time appearance on a Piper's Pit episode of Superstars of Wrestling in February 1987 to ask Andre the Giant to reconsider his recent alignment with Bobby Heenan. Lou briefly worked in Herb Abrams' UWF promotion where he hosted an interview segment. Later that year, Lou took a step back from the wrestling business and portrayed and brought to life a video game icon when he played Mario in the Super Mario Brothers Super Show and also was the voice of Mario during the cartoon. He admitted he almost turned down the role when they told him he had to shave off his trademark goatee until he saw how much money they were going to pay him. The show featured both Mario and Luigi who were running a plumbing company from a basement in Brooklyn. After 65 episodes, Lou returned to the WWF, managing the Head Shrinkers, a team very similar to the Wild Samoans he managed in the early 80s. He took the Head Shrinkers to the tag team titles in a very short time. He left in early 1995, making sporadic appearances as a guest from then on, but never again as a manager. In 2008, on his 75th birthday, at a bar in Queens, New York, ECW original The Sandman gave a drunken toast to his longtime friend, then got into a brawl with the owner of the bar. The rumble made the New York papers and went viral on the internet. Lou, once again, was in the mainstream. He led pop culture into pro wrestling and pro wrestling into pop culture. He was an ambassador for the crossover success, which redefined wrestling into sports entertainment. The events leading up to Lou Albano's face turn proved to be pivotal in the history of the WWF.
Hogan, Piper, and Orton began a feud at Lopper's award ceremony that culminated the war to settle the score. The outcome of the war, Hogan winning by disqualification, was the precursor for the primary match at the first WrestleMania, in which Albano also participated as a face manager. More importantly, the involvement of Lopper, a celebrity completely unrelated to wrestling in the pro wrestling world, was unprecedented. MTV's decision to broadcast a brawl to end it all tremendously increased the WWF's public profile, especially to the young adult demographic. Although older wrestling fans saw this change as a travesty, and to the late 80s wrestling fan, it might seem insignificant. Pro wrestling and its stars have been a part of every aspect of pop culture. Love it or hate it, Captain Lou was a trailblazer. If you take Albano's participation out of the equation, there's a good chance the McMahon expansion would have hit an iceberg and died in early 1985. The attention garnered by the Rock and Wrestling connection, stemming from that chance meeting on an airplane between Lopper and Albano less than two years earlier, led NBC to make the decision to air Saturday night's main event several times per year in the Saturday night live time slot. In 1953, Lou married his high school sweetheart, Geraldine Tango. The marriage lasted 56 years until his death. They had four children. Lou had been noted by several others for his faithfulness to his wife, a rare characteristic in the on-road world of 1970s and 1980s professional wrestling. Lou released his autobiography, often imitated, never duplicated, on July 20, 2008 through his website. The book includes a foreword by Cindy Lauper. Lou passed away on October 14, 2009 of a heart attack while residing in hospice care. He was 76 years old. His final role was as Frankie the Hat in the movie Hot Ice No One Is Safe, which came out in 2010. That was the untold story of Captain Lou Albano.